So, hello. Um, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Audrey Wilson and I am the Community Engagement Officer at the Scottish Council of Archives, um, as well as being on the board of the Archives and Record Association, UK and Ireland's Community Archives and Community Groups. So I recently helped to set up a Scottish regional network of the main Community Archives and Heritage Group and today that Scottish network of community archives and heritage groups and the Scottish Council and Archives bring you this event and I welcome you all to our Sporting Memories Cafe, sharing stories and supporting communities. Our event is part of the National Being Human Festival of the Humanities, which is taking place across the UK between the 12th and the 22nd of November. Being Human is the only national festival of the humanities run by the School of Advanced Study, University of London, in partnership with the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the British Academy. So the festival can be found at Being Human Fest on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook, and the hashtag is being human 2020. We ask you um, to complete a survey. Um, we'll try and put out a link on the Q&A, um, but we'll also send out a me an email after the event. Hopefully um, you will fill in that survey. So today you will hear from the Highlands to the Scottish borders, whether it's football, golf, rugby or shinty, there is something for everyone and a chance to share memories. Hugh Dan McClellan, Scottish broadcaster, an author and sporting academic will start the day and Michael White who developed a football reminiscence project with the Scottish Football Museum and Alzheimer's Scotland will round off the day. You can also hear about the research behind the projects from Professor Richard Haynes, University of Stirling and why they are funded by charities such as Life Changes Trust. So Scotland currently leads the world in reminiscence therapy. Football, cricket, curling, rugby and shinty are among the sports also involved. A collaborative effort of reminiscence groups to stir memories, fulfil lives and also encourage participants back into the sports they love. So I'm just going to take a minute to mention housekeeping for all those not familiar with the Zoom webinar. So as an attendee, your video and audio will be switched off. Your name will be listed in the column of attendees on the right hand side. However, uh, we very much want to hear from you today and encourage you to use the Q&A button. And a colleague of mine, Sean, will be helping to field your questions. We are recording today's webinar and it will be available for everyone to share. So throughout the webinar, we want you to enjoy yourself and we will be having a fun at the comfort break. Uh, we'll have a quiz. Um, the questions will go up. It has been designed by Hugh Dan McClellan, um, who is speaking today, known as a sports veteran, but also happens to be a sports quiz whiz. That was quite difficult to say. Um, and I just want to start off by telling you a little bit about our keynote speaker, who is Hugh Dan McClellan. He's a Scottish broadcaster, author and sporting academic with specific interest in the sport of shinty. He's a fluent Gaelic speaker and he is chief presenter on BBC Alba's quiz show, I'm going to say absent, on BBC Alba with co-presenter Mary Ann MacDonald. Hugh has also made several guest appearances on BBC Scotland programmes looking at life in Scotland. He is currently the non-exec director of Sporting Heritage UK, professional fellow of Academy of Sport and secretary of the Shinty Memories Scotland. So we are delighted to have Hugh as our first speaker. Thank you. Matty Van, Hugus Fadje, Chudakulavars. Welcome to the Drop-In Cafe and thanks to the Scottish Council of Archives for the invitation to make this keynote address this morning. Even if I have been billed as a sports veteran, the end of the day, there's no point in being in denial, I suppose. My own experience of archives and indeed museums and libraries has been built in many years of organised and sometimes haphazard research all over the world from Canada, Nova Scotia to Australia, Ireland and London, yes Edinburgh and Glasgow as well. And that experience has been, I would say, totally enriching, hugely challenging at times and ultimately fantastically productive. Not without its bumps on the road for sure, but what isn't? And I'd like to emphasise at the outset 
that what follows is not intended at any point to be critical of individuals or organisations, but to be a personal perspective on what a lot of us, particularly as volunteers, have been through in the last few months. All of you will be well aware of the challenges of meeting operational adjustments in the face of the impact of a global pandemic, and I don't want to spend time going over the whys and wherefores. We are where we are, and thankfully there now appears to be some clarity about where we could be in a few weeks, if not a few months, time. And in fact, what has happened this week with the emergence of the vaccine treatments has given us all some cause for hope, and thankfully we can look forwards now beyond the cliché-ridden and damaging months which hopefully lie behind us. It made me write, uh, rewrite, in fact, a lot of this for a start. As someone who is shielding for most of the summer, I know only too well what challenges have been faced by professionals in the field and also the volunteers with whom you all work so closely and haven't been able to engage with as you would have been used to. So, I believe the time is now right for us all to shift the focus specifically and clearly onto planning for the new year and the new normal, and I hope that's my last cliché. The challenges for volunteers are very familiar to you all, I'm sure, exacerbated by the changing staffing restrictions and furlough periods. Also, there's been no access to buildings and facilities. For a group like Bednar Shinti Memories, for example, there were issues about accessing materials for memory boxes and a complete change from physical meetings to online activity. A couple of these are general points and apply well beyond Bednar, I'm sure, and are largely perception issues. I should, though, highlight the need for good communication and the need for education and training, particularly about issues such as copyright, handling of artefacts, and the access to them. A lot of that can be dealt with by management of expectations on both sides. What can volunteers expect from staff? And what can staff reasonably expect from increasingly overburdened volunteers who will frequently say, we just want to get on with things, the system and procedures sometimes get in the way and slow things down. I'd stress here that without the support of the Life Changes Trust and Museums Gallery Scotland funding and the establishment of a project officer's post, we couldn't have achieved what we have done in the Bednach Shinti Memories group. And some of all of that and all of the activities is actually very, uh, can be very intimidating for groups who don't have the same resources. Now, for professionals, many of these challenges are painfully obvious. The pressures are internal as well as external. The furlough scheme, time out of the office, but working at home, remember, was and will increasingly become an option post-COVID. Concerns for the archives themselves, no doubt, without as much time or care and attention being uh, offered to them. It's just inevitable. It's, it's what happens in the circumstances. These are some of the challenges faced by reminiscence and memories groups in general, but specifically in Bednach, just because I'm drawing on my own experience, daunting and require some understanding and perhaps even compromise. Again, this isn't a criticism because these things are vital. They're just onerous for volunteers. All the policy documents, for example, data protection, safeguarding, health and safety, volunteer, equality and diversity, Never mind the PVG certific uh, certification scheme, which you can get help with through Volunteer Scotland. And I don't know how long it is since any of you tried to open a bank account, particularly in a rural area, but that is, let me assure you, well nigh an impossibility, but vital nonetheless. So, there are some opportunities, though it's easy to fall into the path of relentless negativity which we've faced in the last few months. We won't go back to where we were. There will be spare capacity in offices and buildings. Zoom and Teams have taken over. More efficiency gains will be sought all over the place. However, new relationships can be built up, as we discovered in Bednoch with the Cairngorms National Park Authority, which we wouldn't have thought of as a partners in the first instance, but that developed due to COVID and other things that were happening in the area. To take a slight step back to 2015, 
When we set up Sports Heritage Scotland, we were acutely aware of the importance of sporting archives in all their shapes and forms. Largely for financial reasons, that organisation became becalmed, but it's now morphing into Sporting Heritage Scotland under the umbrella of the UK organisation. And what has become apparent to me through my involvement at director level is that the new funding opportunities for Sporting Heritage and Archive projects are and will be opening up. But clearly the Sports Heritage and Archive sector is funded quite differently in England. Sports Heritage uh, was um, crucially supported at the outset by sporting bodies and their, their governing bodies uh, when, they were set, when we were set up. Key institutions such as the National Library and the National Portrait Gallery though are now in the new organisation Sporting Heritage Scotland and hopefully the governing bodies will join in. They understandably have other priorities at the moment keeping their sports afloat. Funding from them for projects, particularly archive projects which are low in their priorities, is going to be very difficult, which is why sports are going or having to go it alone beyond their governing bodies, and we'll hear about some examples of that later today. The sport of Shinty doesn't have a national archive as such no sport has, although there are some brilliant local uh, efforts underway, as we're going to hear about later. Indeed, it's questionable if Scotland has a sporting Hall of Fame which is fit for purpose, but that's a matter for another day, perhaps. In 2015, the various Shinty archives were used in a unique collaboration with the SFA Football Museum at Hampden Park to highlight some of what is held in personal and formal collections throughout Scotland. The value of Shinty's archives to the community can't be overstated. Our original resource materials were pretty basic. COVID-19 brought that into sharp focus, as Helen Pickles will demonstrate shortly. A complete shift from physical activity with the Highland Folk Museum to adapting everything we did online, which included the purchase of equipment to aid the delivery of our reminiscence work. Our original resources were, as you saw, very basic, but we've now developed these due to the changing circumstances. We simply had to do it. Where do we go from here? We are expanding, and with that comes greater expectations which have to be managed, and we will, I believe, be looking for more support and more collaboration with the archives sector. We continue to draw our inspiration from our communities, and our families to which we owe so much and we need the support of the archives and the archivists to deliver that. By way of collaboration to date, I'm just showing you briefly the Jack Richmond detail from the Jack Richmond John Willie Campbell collection in the Archive Centre in Inverness. This amount of material couldn't be stored or managed without the professional help and the support of colleagues there and that continues to develop because work is now beginning on processing the Donald Mackay archive, archive of photographs of Shinty, which is going to be installed in Inverness and which will be made available eventually online, but primarily for use with Memories Group work as we tackle challenges posed by dementia, loneliness and other mental health issues. To conclude then, we remain aspirational. We appreciate the support of the Archive Network and the work of all the archivists across the country. Here's an opportunity for us all to work together as professionals, volunteers and funders. And I include the Scottish and UK governments in that without being in any way political. We are, after all, contributing to the nation's health and well-being. And I know that the care home sector in particular is grateful for all the work that is being done and continues to need to be done. I hope the rest of the day is productive and stimulating and I look forward to working with many of you in the future. Well that's great and uh, that was a great kickoff uh, for today's event. Our next speaker is Helen Pickles, who in the past has worked with museum collections at the V&A Dundee, the British Museum and English Heritage. Her current role at the Highland Folk Museum includes working in collaboration with Badenoch 
Shinti Memories, a local sports reminiscence group. Part of her job is coordinating the community activities such as regular Shinti Memories cafes. So Badenoch is the home of Shinti, the most highland of sports, and it is integral to the communities in the area. It has the power to bring people together through the shared memories and passion for the sport. The project aims specifically to connect with and have a positive impact on those who are living with dementia or suffering from isolation or depression. So let's hear from Helen. Hello everybody, my name is Helen Pickles. I'm the project officer at the Highland Folk Museum. And I'm going to be talking today about a successful project that's been running for the past mm, just over one year. So that's uh, the Baden Oak Shinty Memories and the Highland Folk Museum working together on a Shinty project. So I'll give a little bit of background to both the community group and the Folk Museum and the Shinty collection before I move on to talking about what we've been doing in the past year and a bit um, pre-COVID when we were able to hold actual events and then the impact of COVID and lockdown and how we've responded to that. Just to give a bit of geographical context to this virtual presentation and to locate where we are, here's a map to show where the Highland Folk Museum is. So we're based in Newtonmore in the wider area of Badenoch, which incorporates the towns and villages of Lagan, Dalwini, Newtonmore, King AC and King Craig. So the population is no more than 5,000 for the whole of this area. The Folk Museum is positioned in a really central position in Newtonmore, um, so it's the perfect hub point for the project really. Uh, the Folk Museum is managed by High Life Highland, who are um, a charitable trust that manage other leisure and culture facilities across the Highlands, including the libraries and the Inverness Art Gallery and Museum. For those of you watching today who aren't familiar with this sport, Shinty, or Kamenak in Gaelic, is a stick and ball game that shares its origin with the Irish game of hurling. It's thought to have travelled across the sea from Ireland over 1500 years ago, along with Christianity in the Gaelic language, and gradually has become a staple of Highland life. Throughout the centuries and across the country, the sport has waxed and waned in popularity, but has endured and today is thriving in parts of the country, especially in the area of Badenoch. Historically, the game was quite different to the modern sport we know today. Matches would have been played between two villages with any number of players and games could have lasted for hours and be played over grounds miles long. It's also said to have been played as a way to keep clansmen fit and ready for battle. Badenoch is known as the heartland of Shinty. It's been played here for generations. The Kamenak Association, the governing body for the sport, who organised it and standardised the rules, was constituted in King in 1893, and the Badenoch area is renowned for its long-standing link to the sport and a passion that continues in full force to this very day. The two largest villages in the area of Badenoch are Newtonmore and King There's always been a rivalry in Shinty between the two teams, and both have been incredibly successful over the past 120 years of formal shinty being played. Baden Oak Shinty Memories are a subgroup of Shinty Memories Scotland. This national umbrella group encourage and support local shinty clubs and groups of interested parties to set up memories groups in their own area. Baden Oak Shinty Memories was established back in 2016 by two friends and former rivals, John Mackenzie here on the left and Donnie Grant on the right. They played against each other, John for Newtonmore and Donny for King Usi, up to the 1980s, but also were great friends off the pitch. In recent years, Donny received a diagnosis of dementia, and the two of them wanted to use Shinty to start a compassionate community group that used the sport to connect people and support those living with dementia and their families and carers, and also was there for people that might be isolated or lonely, and just for anyone who enjoyed coming together to share memories of the game. Over the past few years, the group have formed a really strong committee with representatives from the church, from the local high school and all the different locations across Badenoch. Through community donations, they've built up a collection of memory boxes, including boots, jerseys, photographs and old programmes. 
In 2019, the Highland Folk Museum was awarded funding from Museums Gallery Scotland to carry out the work on the Shinty Collection, documenting and digitising the objects and 2D material and sharing these stories online. At the same time, Badenoch Shinty Memories had received funding from Life Changes Trust to help them continue and expand on the Shinty reminiscence work they had already started in the community. The two funded projects dovetailed perfectly into a partnership project, with the project officer role to carry out the museum work and help coordinate the work of the community group. I started in position in July 2019, and the 18 months project is due to finish in January 2021. There have been many benefits to the partnership in working with and for the community. The Highland Folk Museum Shinty Collection includes around 200 objects, 200 match programmes, a number of original photographs and very nearly a full set of 48 yearbooks starting from 1971. The collection has come from a number of sources over the past decades. The original founder of the museum, Dr Isabel Grant, clearly wasn't a huge Shinty fan as there was only one Shinty stick, or Cameron, from her collecting days in the 1930s and 40s. Subsequent donations have built the foundation of a comprehensive Shinty collection and include interesting objects such as Shinty sticks showing the various stages of making, medals won by important local players such as this Kamenak Cup medal that belonged to John Dallas of King Uzi, and a selection of Shinty balls, jerseys and other equipment related to the sport. The museum's largest Shinty acquisition is a building, the Boleskine Shinty Pavilion. This sporting pavilion was built in the 1930s for the employees of the British Aluminium Company Limited Works in Foyers, near Loch Ness. It went on to be the home of the Boleskine Shinty Club, but in more recent years the pavilion was unused and threatened with demolition. It was relocated to the Highland Folk Museum in 2013. The pavilion has a small shinty pitch out front which hosts junior matches such as the annual Amfasca Quake. August 2019 saw one of the first partnership events between the museum and the community group. We invited along some local Shinty veterans to come and enjoy the primary school competition held on the pitch, and then they presented the medals to the winning team. Intergenerational contact is a really important aspect of what the group does, and we're lucky to have the support and involvement of the local Shinty clubs and schools to promote this link. At the end of the competition, there was an informal knock around on the pitch for anyone who wanted to have a go at Shinty. Here's Donnie in action, showing us how it's done. From September last year, the group held one community event per month across different locations in Badenoch. These events were to bring people together for company, a cuppa and a blether, and to enjoy looking at photographs, shinty memorabilia and films. This event was held in Lagan Community Hall, and the president of Newton Moore Shinty Club kindly brought along the Kamenak Cup, which had recently won, and people loved seeing this. I also took along some objects from the handling collection at the museum, such as an old thermos flask, a bike light and a Kodak brownie camera, in addition to the material in the Badenoch Shinty Memories box. We held the next Shinty Memories Cafe at Loch Inch in King Craig, and invited along about 15 people, some of whom were living with dementia. It was a lovely session where we looked at photos and chatted about Shinty in small groups, and tried to identify some of the players, events and dates, and we also watched some old archival footage of Shinty matches. Lunch was provided on the day too. In times when physical events were possible, refreshments were a key part of any session. In November last year, we held a Shinty Memories gathering at King Uzi High School. One of the BSMG committee members, Ian McIntosh, teaches at the school and organised a fantastic afternoon that involved many school pupils in different ways, from designing the invitation to serving the tea and cake on the day, and chatting to the guests. Some pupils also performed traditional Scottish music and we had a talk from one of the senior pupils in his role as the school's Shinty ambassador. Some local care home residents came along to the event as well as individuals from the area with a keen interest in Shinty. The Christmas event last year in Newton Moor brought together a number of other popular Highland sports in addition to Shinty. We had bowling, curling and golf too. There were representatives from the local clubs who brought along photographs and equipment and there was plenty of opportunity to chat about the sports and share memories. The Balaville Hotel was also the location for a shinty quiz held earlier this year, which doubled up as a fundraising event. Hugh Dan McLennan produced and hosted a fantastic quiz based on shinty photographs 
when ten teams battled it out for the Shinty Crown. The knight raised over £300 and was a great success. Throughout all the events, the group has been generously supported by local businesses, hotels and organisations who have offered their premises and catering at very reasonable costs. This local support has been invaluable and hopefully is something we can one day take up again when events can safely be resumed. A project that the group were already underway with when I first started in position was the production of five short films and one longer half hour film about the vital role that Shinty plays across the communities of Baden North. The films were produced by a Glasgow based company called Lateral North and they beautifully showcase the importance of the sport in the area, both historically and up to the present day. The films also put across the aims of Baden North Shinty memories in connecting to those individuals who are living with dementia or might be lonely or isolated and in need of company and support through a shared interest. The films are now uploaded onto the Baden North Shinty Memories YouTube channel and have been shown at the events throughout the past year. The official launch of the films was in December last year in collaboration with The Screen Machine, a mobile cinema which tours locations across the Highlands. Michael White, director of Screen Memories, put together a fantastic selection of rarely seen Shinty footage and in addition to the half hour lateral north film showing, it was a fantastic and well attended event. Between October and March, we also run regular reminiscence time travellers sessions in the local care homes and Hanover houses, which provide sheltered accommodation to residents. These took place every two weeks on rotation between the four homes. The sessions are a wonderful demonstration of what the partnership between the museum and the community group can achieve, as we took along objects from the Folk Museum Handling Collection, in addition to the Shinty objects. This meant we could broaden out the theme from just Shinty, to other familiar and interesting objects from the past for all to en enjoy and engage with. A high proportion of residents don't necessarily have a background or interest in Shinty, so this was a way to involve everyone. We had anywhere between six and 20 people attending each session and always just played it by ear rather than having a strict structure to the sessions, which were usually about an hour or so in length. There was always a lot of laughter and great stories and of course, plenty of tea and biscuits too. Objects that engage the senses, such as smell or touch, are particularly effective, such as this Omo washing powder box with powder still inside. Soap, shaving cream and tobacco tins were also popular items, although a person's sense of smell can decline with age, so these objects won't always be evocative to every person. Photographs are usually great conversation starters too, and here Donnie is sharing his own scrapbook of shinty photos and articles at one group session. It's worth bearing in mind that some people might have limited vision, in which case photographs can be difficult or impossible for them to engage with. The bigger and clearer the image, the better. It's great to have a variety of objects or formats to allow different types of interaction. For example, music or theme tunes can be particularly effective for reminiscence. There have been a number of training sessions delivered throughout the year, including the Shinty Reminiscence Training Session run by Hugh Dan McLennan and Michael White, who are both speaking today about their roles in other Sporting Memories projects. This training session was opened out to committee members, Shinty Club representatives, other local sports groups such as the golf clubs, local care home staff and the Shinty ambassadors from the high school also attended. We've had great support from Alzheimer's Scotland too from the beginning and Kenny Wright, the local dementia link worker, delivered a mini dementia friends session on that day. In March 2020, we invited Kenny back to run a full dementia friends session for all permanent and seasonal staff at the Highland Folk Museum. This was a direct result of the partnership project and the desire for the museum to become dementia friendly. 45 members of staff took part in the training. It goes to show the positive impact that the baden Shinty Memories Group are having on the wider community and local organisations in spreading the message about dementia awareness and reducing the stigma of the condition. The community group have recently established a relationship with the Dementia Research Department at the University of Stirling and have attended some online dementia education sessions with them. The content and delivery of this training was excellent and we have arranged the sessions to be rolled out to other Shinty Memories groups. Some of the administrative things we've sorted out in the past year to help the organisation and communication of the group are a mobile phone number, Gmail address and Google Drive for sharing documents, 
a mailing list which now has around 100 contacts on it. We've created a small suite of policies, data protection, safeguarding, health and safety, volunteer policy, inequality and diversity. We decided that these are the fundamentals, although it's likely that more will come in time. PVG certifications for the committee and any volunteers. This is a protection, protection of vulnerable groups registration scheme administered for free through Volunteer Scotland. It's an important part of the safeguarding process when working with groups classed as vulnerable. SCIO application. The group is currently a constituted community group, but will soon be applying to become a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation. This has the advantage of protecting the committee members from any personal liability and also opens up access to more funding channels. When the COVID restrictions came into place, the group stopped all physical events and activities. Like all groups and organisations, we went through an adjustment process of responding to the situation and figuring out what we could do now the events could no longer be held. The committee remained dedicated, hardworking and positive throughout, and we've been able to adapt to a different way of keeping in touch with the people who would ordinarily have come along to our sessions. One of the main things we've done is start a newsletter. This is a really effective and popular way of keeping connected and sharing Shinty memories and also has a real reach into the wider community as it includes articles about local points of interest, quizzes, recipes and even a regular column kindly provided by a local sheet. As well as being distributed digitally through the mailing list, we make sure we have around 150 printed copies per edition for individuals and care homes so that it's fully accessible to those who are not online or IT literate. We've also produced USB sticks with a compilation of Shinty films and footage on them, which we distributed to interested parties. We made sure that family members or carers are able to show the films to those who might not be able to access them by themselves. Through the Life Changes Trust funding, we were also able to purchase laptops for those care homes that were lacking the equipment. The group also have an active Facebook and YouTube channel for sharing news, stories, photos and films. When the second edition of the newsletter came out, we also distributed cake boxes to local Shinty veterans and supporters as a way of letting people know we were thinking of them and still here for them, and just to spread a bit of happiness through cake. The group also coordinated a wonderful link between the S1 and S2 high school pupils and the local care homes with the Letters Through Lockdown initiative. Teacher Ian McIntosh asked the pupils to pen letters and cards to the residents to let them know what they'd been up to through the lockdown period. Some drew pictures and included photos and told them about their families and their favourite hobbies. The letters spread a bit of hope and enjoyment to the residents in the homes who hadn't been able to have any outside contact for many months. Some residents sent cards and letters back to the pupils. This intergenerational link is something that is really important and the group hopes to build on this in the future. Another great initiative that Baden Oak Shinty Memories and the Highland Folk Museum have been involved in is a digital Shinty trail produced by the Cairngorms National Park Authority. This online map highlights important Shinty stories and locations across Baden Oak, so it perfectly complements the work of the Shinty group and museum. There are numerous photographs to illustrate the content, and Baden Oak Shinty Memories group has been given a prominent platform for their videos. There's also a section of the site dedicated to the group too, directing people to the Facebook group or mailing list. It's been a really successful collaboration and the park have been very grateful for the input from members of the group and their knowledge and photographs. The website will be a useful resource for the group to use in memory sessions in the future and hopefully more stories will be added over time. Here are some tips learnt from the experience of the past year. Community support is vital. Get to know other local groups, organisations, charities and care homes. The Shinty Memories Project has been able to have a wide impact into the community due to the strong relationships that have been established and strengthened from the point that John and Donnie started the group together back in 2016. It is successful due to the support and involvement of many different local people and organisations. Get to know what other groups do, share knowledge and help each other. Free dementia awareness training is available from Alzheimer's Scotland and Age Scotland. Make use of the expert knowledge that's on hand. Now much of it is online too. Start small. Newsletters are really effective. 
Facebook is too for those that are online. Anything you do to keep connected to people will be spreading some happiness. Don't worry about having to do too much. Keep it manageable and then it's more likely to, likely to be sustainable too. On the note of sustainability, this is one of the biggest challenges that any community group faces. Keeping the momentum going is difficult. As mentioned before, support and buy-in from other organisations is really fundamental. Badenoch Shinta Mumries are lucky to have a very strong committee who have a valuable range of skills and contacts, in addition to local support, which certainly helps strengthen their position. Recruiting and maintaining volunteers is also vitally important, but tricky too. It was something the group were keen to prioritise this year and has been made much harder by not being able to hold any events. Having a clear and defined role for volunteers is important and makes it more likely that they'll want to get involved. Volunteers are crucial to any group and I've been overwhelmed at how dedicated and hardworking the baden Shinti Memories volunteers have been throughout this project and it shows how much a small group can achieve. Recruiting more volunteers, volunteers is still a key priority for the coming year to ease the pressure and share the workload. Both Museums Gallery Scotland and Life Changes Trust have been fantastic funders. Life Changes Trust provide a wealth of support, knowledge and encouragement and are in regular contact to share news about other dementia friendly projects and opportunities. Sadly, the funding arrangement with both is coming to an end and the group are actively looking for more funding to continue the work. Becoming a SCIO should help with this as it opens up funds available to charities. Being a subgroup of a national group has some financial benefits too, as money is sometimes available to apply for through the umbrella group. The group are also hopeful that philanthropy might play a part in their future, in sourcing funds from local individuals or estates that are supportive of the group. Thanks very much for listening today. I hope it's been a useful insight into a Sporting Memories partnership and that you're encouraged to set up your own group or even get involved in ours. Um, I just want to say, uh, well, thank you to Helen for that presentation, but I do um, acknowledge that we're having some problems with the uh, people actually being able to um, come on to the webinar. So I'm going to be looking at that um, and, and seeing if I can send out the link to people again. Um, also, we'll have a look at the Q&A button because it seems to be a problem with anyone entering anything into it. Um, I don't know. Uh, we'll, we will try and get this resolved very quickly. Um, so bear with us, please. Sorry about that. I'd like to just keep things moving along a bit um, with our next um, presentation, uh, this time about golf. So um, just a little bit um, about uh, Lorraine. Uh, Lorraine Young, who is a formal chief social worker for Angus and she's also a Rotarian. Lorraine chose to commit her free time to creating and supporting the development of golf memories. She's a founder and chair of the Carnoustie Golf Memories Group, which was launched in 2015 and is part of the overall golf memories project, which in turn is part of the wider Sports Heritage Scotland network, which is helping those living with dementia and memory loss. So the group is ably supported by a committed and dedicated team of volunteers. And as well as meeting up and sitting around and enjoying reminiscing about golf, Lorraine is a great advocate of getting back into the physical act of playing golf. And as in uh, Lorraine's own words, for many years when they have a diagnosis of dementia, they believe they can't play golf anymore or have a place in clubs. What we're trying to do is show that physical activity and social interaction are very important by supporting members to reconnect with what for many has been a long life passion. So let's hear Lorraine's talk. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Lorraine Young and I'm the founder and chair of Canoosty Memories. Canoosty Memories is a registered charity with Oscar and is the mother group supporting and managing golf memories, football action and as of just prior to lockdown, musical memories. We are 100% volunteer-led and managed by a small but strong and highly dedicated committee who, along with our team of volunteers, are constantly seeking different approaches to meet the evolving and changing needs of our members. Our volunteers are without doubt the backbone and strength in all we do and respond with empathy and compassion to the needs of our members. 
Golf Memories Carnoustie was launched in 2015 with the key aim of providing focused, meaningful activities complemented by physical activity and social interaction for people living with dementia, memory loss or who are isolated within our community. In most instances, our members had played out of one of the local golf clubs. However, when they reached the point where they could no longer participate in a competitive manner, they also stepped back from the club, thus creating a massive void in their lives, with the resulting feeling for them of loss of worth and purpose within their community. Golf clubs did not always understand the change in an individual's behaviour or demeanour, and therefore did not routinely encourage the member back into the club. I am delighted to say that culture is now changing and I will talk later about our engagement with our clubs. In their own way, each member has an extraordinarily rich history and story to tell. We have found by reconnecting them with a lifelong passion for golf, it provides each the platform to relive their precious memories and create some new ones. Creating a bridge for us to cross into the reality of each member is essential, as one size does not fit all. During this presentation, I will describe the background to our Carnoustie story and share with you a few of the very rich stories that we have been privileged to hear and how we have supported the creation of new and very special moments and memories for our members. And also, positive, loving and lasting memories for their families. Canoustie is located on the northeast coast of Scotland with a population of just over 11,000. It is best known on the world stage for being a world-class venue for golf, hosting the Open and for its rich golf history. Canoustie, like many other small towns, benefits from a strong and caring community support network which is truly intergenerational. Complemented through the involvement of the high school, local football club, Carnoustie Golf Links and other organisations. Since 2014, when I had my first conversation with Carnoustie Golf Links in relation to establishing our Golf Memories programme, they've been totally supportive of all we do. They've always gone above and beyond to make sure the needs of all our members are catered for. The staff look out for our members, making each one feel special and truly welcome. Plus, supporting our volunteers and members when using the simulation bays. One of the key aspects of each session is the availability of access to the Nesty, a six-hole par three course, and the simulation bays within the performance centre. The visible and sensory benefits of holding a golf club once more is breathtaking. The first lady who joined our group had poor mobility but was encouraged and supported into a simulation bay. What unfolded before our eyes was breathtaking. The lady assumed the correct stance, standing straight and unaided, then proceeded to continue her setup routine before hitting the sweetest ball imaginable. Before our eyes, she had reverted some 30 or so years to when she had been a club champion. Current members routinely display similar outcomes. Ian was an exceptionally good golfer and has been revered by his peers over the years. He's been a member of our group from the start and whilst his mobility has decreased over time, it is wonderful to watch the transformation when golf comes back into play for him, either through the use of memorabilia or when holding a club. The first image shows Ian arriving at Link's house in a wheelchair, sitting in his favourite spot next to his idol, Gary Player. On this day, the weather was kind and we were able to go out onto the nesty. The brief video clip demonstrates the transformation that took place far better than any narrative can. Well 
So, Mr. Foggy, how does that feel? <laughs> These smiling images show the truly sociable man that Ian is and the true benefits of social interaction and stimulation. Willie is a senior member of a very well-known golfing family here in Carnoustie and the life and soul of each session. His father was the winner of the Crows Nest Tassie in both 1938 and 1939 and retained the cup throughout the war years. Whilst Willie has never won this trophy himself, he does lay claim to it in a different and quite remarkable way. The trophy was used as a font to christen him back in 1943, before it was returned to the links. Sadly, the photo of this event still eludes us, but we remain optimistic. In his own right, at 21, with a handicap of two, he became club champion. He also played over the years for Angus County and then became president of the association. He also became captain of Carnoustie Golf Club and junior convener, promoting golf as a great social asset. He was very proud to hold the role of Chief Marshal at the Open in 1968. His nephew, Eric Ramsey, has carried on the family golfing prowess and back in 2005 won the Australian Amateur Championship. One of the seven simulation bays bears a plaque to commemorate this achievement. The richness of the stories Willie tells and his detailed recall has spurred us to start seeking a means of recording his and other stories for future generations. The 147th Open Championship here in Carnoustie was, in its own right, a huge success. However, for our members, it was both an amazing and magical experience. Many believed they would never see, far less attend, another Open Championship. Courtesy of the RNA, they were able to attend this major event and relished every minute. During the weeks prior to the Open, members loved watching all the setup from their elevated position in Lynx House. The professionals out on the course during practice days, having a bird's eye view of the first tee, and an extra special coup was a visit to the group by Adam Scott, arranged by Craig Both, Lynx Superintendent. Adam made time for each member and chatted with each on an individual basis. His open demonstration of compassion has stayed with the group. The photo Bernie had taken with Adam is still one of his prized possessions. The Open Championship here in Carnoustie opened the door to opportunities for our members which we could not have dreamt of. The Golf Channel heard of our group project and sought permission to film a session. They spent a whole day with our members. NBC relayed the footage across America on the Friday of the Open after having interviewed the late Professor of Human Development and Family Studies, Michael Eagle from Connecticut University. Professor Eagle had visited Carnoustie twice and on his last visit spent the day with our members. To this day, his words have stayed with me when he described feeling blown away by what he had witnessed and the positive impact the intervention was having. Professor Eagle left stating he wanted to set up a golf group in the States to mirror what he had witnessed here in Carnoustie. The showing of a film clip in America produced another two surprises for the group. Firstly, I was contacted by the recently retired National Director of Golf, Billy Detlaff, from TPC Sawgrass in Florida, who was, a, who was very keen to start Golf Memories there. The feature inspired Billy to fly over from America and spend time with us here in Carnoustie, gathering as much information as he could from the model that we had developed. In no time at all, he established the Pete Dye Chapter, American Golf Memories Project, and with the blessing of Carnoustie Golf Link's Chief Executive, Michael Wells, promotes the partnership as a sister programme to the Carnoustie Golf Memories Project, Scotland. The American project is now supporting and encouraging 
the development of Gulf Memories projects across America, and we plan to include our American friends in a Zoom session with our members prior to Christmas. Secondly, a gentleman whom one of our members had caddied for back in 1994 recognised him on the film and made contact. It transpired that he had not only caddied, but on another trip played a couple of rounds with him on the championship and Burnside courses. They had lost touch over the years, but were now delighted to be reunited through golf. At the end of the presentation, I will highlight links for you to access the Golf Channel video clip and one or two other relevant video clips from Carnoustie. When planning the setup of our programme, we spoke with members and their families about what exactly they had enjoyed most as a club member. The social aspect beyond their weekly game was the clear winner. It was decided therefore that we had to make our programme all-encompassing to provide our members with a true feeling of self-worth, a sense of belonging and above all, enjoying once again being part of the golf family. And my goodness, what fun and enjoyment they have had on these outings. Blessed by good weather, we were able to play the Himalayas putting course at St Andrews, followed by lunch in the British Golf Museum. Then rounded off the day with a much appreciated tour of the museum. The merging of the physical activity and the museum visit was a huge success. It was fascinating to hear the recall sparked by the vast range of memorabilia within the museum, confirming for us that we needed to continually expand and refresh our range of memorabilia for our members. A different type of visit was made to Kingarrick Hickory Golf Course and Clubhouse. This was topped off by playing a hole or two and putting on the hickory course with hickory shafted clubs. Two of our local golf clubs have also hosted visits and shared their extensive range of priceless memorabilia. At the Carnoustie Golf Club, Bernie was delighted to be shown a photo of himself on the club's gallery wall and thoroughly enjoyed reliving stories about others in the photo and his then golf partners. Our second trip was out to Panmure Golf Club at Barry where many of the members had played. The day of our visit was Ladies Day at the club and to the sheer delight of one of our ladies, we were joined for a time by the chair of Carnoustie Golf Links. Both trips were thoroughly enjoyed by all and on neither day were they in any hurry to leave and were made to feel very much at home in both club settings. Following the golf club tradition, each year we organise a Christmas lunch for members and carers, with a musical prelude from the high school brass band helping to get everyone into the Christmas spirit. A special request is made for Santa to visit, and he is never disappointed. Santa helps to add that extra feeling of good cheer and companionship. As I have mentioned, we are blessed by living in such a strong and community-focused area. Without a shadow of doubt, our community and our volunteers are our greatest asset and strength, helping to make all we do not just a possibility, but an actual reality. Donald Ford, who in his own right has a significant and varied sporting background, is also a talented landscape and golf course photographer and joins the group whenever possible to share stories with members. We also benefit from having in the region of a hundred of his golf course images, which stimulate lots of varied discussions. The Link Superintendent, Craig Both, is another Wheel Kent face in our group. Craig routinely supports us by ensuring the putting areas and the nesty are ready for our competitions, so that we may decide who the winner of our own unique claret jug is at the end of each session. Members particularly enjoy the putting area when marked out for bagatelle. In relation to the claret jug, believe me, the winning of this trophy is no token gesture and is hard fought for. From the outset, it was the unanimous decision of our committee that all our activities would be free to our members. 
As volunteers, we saw this as our way of giving back to our community. We have no salaries or other overheads to pay, which made the same achievable. This year, due to COVID, we've not been able to support the window displays created by a growing number of our shopkeepers in the town, using a fabulous array of memorabilia, or the pictorial Who Am I? golf competition. These activities all serve a dual purpose of awareness raising within the community and fundraising. Plans are now underway in preparation for 2021. Our community, local businesses, golf clubs and shops are to be highly commended for all their active interest and support. All these events have proven to be truly intergenerational with grandparents and grandchildren completing the route from the high street down to the golf course at Lynx House. The use of memorabilia is an important part of what we do but this now comes in a range of formats. We have found the use of short video clips and a range of items which members can look at and handle to be quite powerful. The use of a range of different memorabilia, ranging from golf tournament programmes to the old style, small size golf ball is an important part of our toolkit. We also extensively use sets of players cards and try to pair these with specific events, for example, Open Champions. A different approach by one of our volunteers proved enthralling for members when he demonstrated the art and skill of whipping the shaft of a golf club and telling how he learned this craft. Lockdown in March this year, along with the ongoing restrictions, have proven exceedingly difficult for all our members and their carers. The feeling of isolation increased as all the external support mechanisms were taken away from them. We chose, however, to see this as an opportunity for us as volunteers to find solutions to bridge this gap. Along with Richard McBriarty for football and Michael White for rugby and screen memories, we started to post daily on Facebook and Twitter. For the past eight months, we have posted two quiz questions and two images of golf courses every day to give members and carers a daily talking point. The answers are posted the following day, but in truth, the answer is almost irrelevant. The focus and importance is based on stimulating a discussion about a much loved sporting activity, which has played an important and key part of their life. The most positive feedback has been from family members who say they have used the quiz material as a family quiz with their loved one making visits pleasurable, positive and meaningful. Not all our members or carers had access to social media. Therefore, we started to prepare weekly doorstep packs comprising of all quiz material and pop these through members and carers letterboxes. The audience reached by the quiz material extends far beyond our local group and is posted under Golf Memories Scotland, the steering group which I am privileged to chair. A number of our members enjoyed doing word searches, so a weekly 10 question quiz and word search was included. The feedback from both these relatively small ways of reaching out to our members was incredibly positive, but they still miss seeing each other, along with the exchange of friendly banter that always ensued at our meetings. Our natural progression was to extend our reach by creating weekly Zoom virtual sessions alternating topics between golf and football, with all members being encouraged to join both should they wish to. We chose to use some of our group funds to purchase tablets for the use of members and carers who would otherwise not be able to join the session to ensure as far as possible that no one was left feeling isolated or excluded. The weekly Zoom sessions have taken us to the closest point achievable to our former sessions with the stories and laughter flowing. The Zoom sessions totally blew away the myth that seniors would struggle with technology, as with family support they have taken to it like a duck to water. Families have been incredibly supportive and for some it has proven to be a window into their loved one's life and passion for the game. This different form of home-based interaction 
re-established their position as head of the family within their family group. Grandchildren and other family members saw, for some, the first time, a truly well-informed and very keen sportsman whose passion and knowledge of the game astounded them. Long after the sessions are over, the conversations continue enriching their family life. I hope this brief resume of the Canusi story has been helpful and encourages other golf clubs to consider establishing a group in their own community. Each golfing community, from small villages to larger towns, will have their own history and historians to help them create their own story. I would like to finish by showing some comments from families about the benefits from their perspective of golf memories. This will be followed by my contact details should anyone wish additional information. And finally, links to access the NBC video and other material. Well, that's great. Um, that was great from Lorraine, actually, there. Um, lots of information, lots of links as well that I think you'll find useful. Um, I would encourage you to use the Q&A button. Um, our speakers are actually hidden behind the scenes, so I encourage them also to answer any questions that come up. Feel free. I think we have managed to get everyone the Zoom link. There was a problem with that, but I think we've sorted that out. So hopefully no more technical hitches. Um, carrying on um, to our next speaker, who's Murray Watson. Um, his career you, um, really combines a unique blend of entrepreneurial marketing and the pursuit of academic history. Um, since 2013, he has been the convener of the Hoyk Rugby Memories Club for Reminiscence Therapy, which uses old rugby photos, DVDs, old programmes and other memorabilia to stimulate memories in a friendly social environment that benefits people with memory problems, as well as providing company for those who live lonely and isolated lives. Murray is also the co-creator of a digital rugby heritage archive, um, cataloging and preserving and making accessible using traditional and digital methods, um, sort of a unique collection of rugby related documents. So that includes photos, programs, diaries, and other memorabilia, um, which belong to the late Bill McLaren, who many of you will know, um, often referred to as the voice of rugby and of Hoyt um, RFC. So the title of his talk is, I was there in 1938 when Scotland won 21-16, which is unusual actually, and it refers to Scotland beating England at Twickenham. Uh, this was a great year for Scotland. Um, they won their 12th title, um, also winning the Triple Crown and the Calcutta Cup. So Murray will be probably talking a little bit about that in his presentation. But the other thing that's a bit interesting um, is he will be looking at the other senses and how smell, taste, sound and touch all help people with dementia remember the past. So let's hear from Murray. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to a virtual Mansfield Park, the home of the famous Greens and the first Rugby Memories Club in the world. This morning I want to talk about three things. First, I'd like to share our experience of using Rugby Memories as a form of reminiscence therapy for people with memory issues, as well as enhancing well-being for socially isolated older people. Indeed, anyone with a love of the game. I will start by looking at the conduct of our meetings before moving on to look at our relationships with archives and the exciting potential of digital access. I will now move back in time and to the west of Hoyk, to Hillersden, the home of the late, great Bill McLaren. In 2001, Bill told me, and I can't do his accent, I was there in 1938 when Scotland won 21-16. Bill told me this in a PhD research interview when I was exploring the relationships between England and Scotland. Bill was recalling Wilson Shaw's Calcutta Cup triumph in winning the Triple Crown at Twickenham. Before pressing the start button on my cassette recorder, 
Bill recalled that he was accompanied to the home of English rugby by my father, also by Watty Lunn and half a dozen other friends from Hoyk, all of whom he named. What a memory. Sadly, Bill's memory subsequently deteriorated before he died in 2010. One way or another, Bill has played an important role in the activities of the Hoyt Rugby Memories Club, and he will reappear from time to time during my presentation. Thanks to the vision of Michael White, it is now well known how looking at sporting images in the form of photographs, old programs, and the miscellany of other memorabilia can rekindle lost memories, and in the process, create a range of clinical and social benefits for participants. What might interest you is that four of the other five senses can also help to revive memories. Let me explain. We're very fortunate that Bill is a teary, a hoik man. As the voice of rugby, the sound of his distinctive hoik accent has an equally beneficial impact on our participants' memories. We always end our meetings with a vintage video and Bill is invariably the commentator. We would therefore argue that sound is also an important memory jogger. Smell is another. A quick spray from a can of Raljex at a meeting would remind people of rugby changing rooms. Marcel Proust suggested that taste also facilitated reminiscence. Sadly, when I wanted to experiment by giving everyone a Hoyt ball, the health and safety people suggested that they might break people's dentures. We were on safer grounds with touch, the feel of an old leather ball or touching the number 14 jersey Tony Stanger wore when he won the Grand Slam was a highlight for many. Tony's mum, Elizabeth, is one of our regular attendees. And on the day Tony was our guest speaker, she mentioned that she had embroidered the words Grand Slam into the collar. Let me go back to the beginning. Eight years ago, Michael White approached the Hoyt Rugby Club and asked if it would be the first rugby club in Scotland to create a rugby memories group based on the success of football memories. Our first meeting was held in the community hospital day room with half a dozen people with various degrees of memory issues. Michael White used the occasion to show May Sinclair, Alan McCready and I what could be achieved. I came away a convert. I'll never forget one lady who would not make eye contact and who would not engage even after showing her lots of different photos. Eventually, I showed her a photo of a 1950s picture of spectators at an international match. There were lots of flat caps and a layer of cigarette smoke hovering over the crowd. I asked her what she saw. She looked at it and said, there are no women. She immediately became engaged and animated. Conversation flowed. Our time at the community hospital was relatively short as we moved to the club rooms at Mansfield Park. The facilities were better and more appropriate. We had more space providing the ability to have participants facing each other across tables. There was good AV equipment on tap, but above all, there was the nostalgic atmosphere of a rugby club and not the smell of disinfectant. After a few experimental meetings, we soon developed a formula that worked and was popular with our members who came in ever increasing numbers month after month. Each meeting lasted an hour and a half on the first Thursday of, of the month during the rugby season. We found it best to divide each session into three starting off with a guest speaker sharing their rugby memories. So many characters have given generously of their time. I can honestly say we've not had one single disaster. Every one of the speakers has caught the imagination of the audience, regaling us with their rugby memories. You will recognize a few faces here. We have had countless internationalists, sundry British Lions, three Scottish coaches, even one English international. We've had numerous club players, including three from Gala. We have devoted sessions to Hoyt Junior Clubs. The afternoon devoted to the Hoyt Trades attracted one of our largest audiences. 
we usually ask one journalist the season, as well as other non-players such as referees and officials. All of rugby is represented, both male and female. In recent years, we have asked players to bring along memorabilia. The most common is old jerseys, but we've also had the Calcutta Cup. John Rutherford brought along his golden boot, awarded for being the player of the year, and Chris Patterson brought along his three caps. The middle half hour is devoted to enjoying a cuppa and a blether while looking at any memorabilia brought in by the guest speaker. We also use the library of photographs supplied by Michael. In Hoyk, we are especially blessed by being able to access some fantastic collections of old photos, programs and other rugby bits and bobs. I do not know what we would do without all the materials supplied by May Sinclair and Alan McCready. May, who knows everybody you need to know in the game, has also become our official photographer, and many of the excellent shots you will have seen in the slides are down to May. After tea and over the noisy hubbub of chatter and laughter, I usually struggle to call the meeting to order so that we can move into our final section. We end the meeting by showing a vintage video clips. There is usually method in our madness by our trying to link up the speaker and the memorabilia on show over tea to what is shown on the big screen. That was certainly the case when Ken Scotland was our guest speaker a year ago last October. Alan McCready had managed to source an old New Zealand tourist board film from 1959. The grainy black and white film included footage of the British Lions, including Ken playing against the All Blacks. What we didn't know was that Ken would turn up wearing his 1959 British Lions blazer. And if I made a dress, I can't fit into a blazer I owned 20 years ago, let alone 60 years ago. How many of us could? What was also distinctly spooky was that Ken had brought along his tour diary. Ken read out a lengthy extract describing the game we subsequently watched on the big screen. We could not have planned the juxtaposition any better if we had tried. This tour was especially important for Ken and the importance of his rugby memories was highlighted by a BBC journalist who interviewed Ken in what he liked to call his nostalgia stroke vanity room. According to the journalist, Ken's little den is festooned with old black and white photographs, and I quote, a picture taken in 1959 of 30 blazered lions peering through the glass frame. At that rugby memories meeting last October, we were honored to be sharing Ken's memories. And if you would permit me one piece of personal nostalgia. Just before Ken came down to Hoyk, my wife and I were speaking with our hairdresser, her hairdresser, who told us that her eight-year-old son, recently back from school, came recently back from school in a highly excited state. He had just been coached by his hero, Stuart Hogg. I can tell you that is something he will never forget. When I was of a similar age in 1958, I can still remember being taught to tackle on a rubber mat in the gym at Heriot's by no less than Ken Scotland. Now that's what I call a rugby memory. Let me uh, get back to our vintage videos. As I mentioned earlier, sound is an important memory jogger as sight. We are lucky to be able to listen to the voice of Bill. Most of the folk at our meetings are the new Bill as a teacher or a colleague a fellow player or just a friend. We all knew him as a commentator. And while a number of us are no longer capable of dancing in the streets of Hoyk, his voice and commentaries will never be forgotten. Many of us also remembered the voices of Cliff Morgan, Peter West, Nigel Starmer Smith, and a fellow Teary, the late Stuart McCullough. Some of the games we show are in black and white, and some in the audience recognize themselves when they were playing as young men. We often laugh at the haircuts and sideboards, but always admired the spirit in which the games were played. For many of us, we like when scrums form without having to crouch, touch, and whatever else the new laws say. Universally, we prefer the way that players used to look for space to run into 
rather than deliberately running into players to set up a ruck or mall. But then, wasn't it always better in the old days? However one looks at it, these vintage videos are an important tool in our work and usually a good way to end each meeting on an upbeat note. A couple of years back, I attended a conference about sporting memories at Hamden Park. There was a presentation about football memories and the speaker mentioned walking football. I was sitting towards the back next to Sandy Carmichael and like a naughty boy, I whispered, what about walking rugby? Back came the answer, what a great idea. I immediately started looking for information when I got back home. I discovered that there was quite a lot of walking rugby played, especially in England. The clubs involved tended to cater for people who had recently step, stopped playing or who were in middle age. We were all of more mature years. We also had as many, if not more, female members than men, and some of us were in wheelchairs. Walking rugby as it was played elsewhere was not really appropriate. However, as you all know, people in Hoyt never give up. And so Alan McCready, David Wright and I set about creating a set of rules, or as Alan would insist on calling them laws, for the more mature player. You will see from the slide that we're a happy bunch. Our specially created laws worked well, other than having to put a speed limit on Marion's wheelchair, as she could speed past anyone going at walking pace. We had a lot of fun and laughter. There were beneficial cardiovascular rewards and hand-eye coordination improved. And just as there is, uh, just as there is in normal rugby, we've had injury problems, though they tend to be for conditions like arthritis or osteoporosis. We have no need for concussion protocols either, as there is no contact, no tackling, scrums, lineouts, or kicking. COVID has put a stop to our activities, but we intend to resume as soon as it is safe to do so. Hopefully, this will be well before the next team of all Blacks play in Scotland. When they come over here, they are accompanied by a touring party of older supporters who are always our guests for lunch at Mansfield Park. The last time they were here, I challenged their tour guide, the former All Black, Murray Pierce, to a game of walking rugby the next time they came. In the words of Nigel Starmer Smith, a game involved, involving the Hoyt under 80s, playing a team of the elderly All Black supporters, would be something to savour. This would not be the first time, uh, uh, first All Blacks encounter at Mansfield Park. The first time was in 1888, when the All Blacks only managed a narrow victory over Hoyk. This brings me neatly on to archiving. Believe it or not, the programme on the screen fell out from the pages of one of Bill McLaren's large collection of books about rugby. In fact, one of our early meetings was devoted to revisiting All Black games played at Mansfield Park. The session was led by George Keown, one of our resident Kiwis who used to play for Hoyt in the late 1960s and who also coached uh, school kids alongside Bill McLaren and our own May St. Clair. George told me that after the 1888 game, Hoyt was presented with a Maori ceremonial spear. He asked if I could dig, lay my hands on it so that he could pass it around during tea. We hunted high and low, and the spear was nowhere to be seen. We did, however, find a vast treasure trove of other photos, documents, programs, and a miscellany of ephemera. There were springbok horns brought back from a lion's tour, two caps dating back to 1896, letters inviting Hoyt players to secret rugby league trials in Manchester in the 1950s, a total of 547 rugby ties, plaques, pennants, Irish international touch flags fastened to shillelaghs from the 1948 game against Scotland, and a lot, lot more. We had an archive in the making, and when I was asked to pack up every, and list everything in Bill McLaren's glory hall, we had the potential to create one of the best rugby archives around. This is exactly what we planned to do. 
we created a partnership involving Hoyt Rugby Club, the Bill McLaren Foundation and Live Borders, who run the archives and the Heritage Hub in the heart of Hoyt. Then along came the pandemic. In the week of lockdown, starting on 23rd of March, we were all set to hold our first training session for a group of 12 volunteers who are going to catalogue, store, and add detailed metadata to the Live Borders collection management system and online catalogue. There were also exciting plans to digitise the collection. This not only aids conservation and preservation, it opens up online access 24 seven from anywhere in the world. The future is certainly digital, but we have been obliged to stop putting our plans into action. And I'm sure you'll understand that I'm not yet in a position to pass on our experience. We have, however, gone digital with our rugby memories meetings. All our members are survivors of the 1957 Asian flu pandemic and the 1968 Hong Kong flu pandemic. We were not going to let the current pandemic interrupt our activities. So we have gone digital, recreating our face-to-face -face meetings online. There is a link to our first meeting on the screen. Do have a look later. As I speak, we're waiting to hear whether we've been successful in our application for community funding to create more programs to take us through until uh, COVID uh, has finished and we can hold face-to-face -face meetings again. I hope you've enjoyed listening to our experience and find something of value to take away from today's webinar. Uh, I end by admitting to one mistake. We should have recorded and filmed all our guest speakers. They shared some wonderful rugby memories and brought more than a ray of sunshine into people's lives. I end with two of my favorite reminiscences. The first is from Dean Richards, top right. He told us that early in his career, he was a substitute for England playing in a Calcutta Cup match at Murrayfield. When back row Tim Rodber went down injured, Dean was called onto the pitch as a substitute from his seat in the West Stand. But there was a problem. He got stuck in the lift. Such is the life of an international rugby player. I end with some information that surprised us all. During his talk, Derek Turnbull, the Hoyk and Scotland forward, told us that he honed his competitive spirit by playing carpet bowls in the village halls found in the hills around Hoyk. Perhaps there is a message here for Scotland's coach, Gregor Townsend. Thank you. Well, thank you, Murray. Um, I can actually also tell you that Murray has been successful in getting additional funding, and maybe that's something that can be talked about um, in the dedicated Q&A session, which is at the, the end of all the presentations. Um, today it starts um, about uh, just before one o'clock. Um, but let's move on to football. Um, and we're going to hear from uh, Richard McBrearty, who is the project director at Football Memory Scotland and the curator of the Scottish Football Museum at Hampden. Um, he manages the National Football Memories Project um, to develop and support football reminiscence sessions for people with Alzheimer's and other memory problems. So you'll hear about the successful Memory Box project and how the funding is raised for projects like this and many others. Uh, Richard is particularly successful at fun finding funds for projects, I must say. Um, and at the end of Richard's talk, there will be a separate short film of an Aberdeen football fan story of living with dementia. And we thank UEFA uh, for allowing us to show this film at our event. So let's hear from Richard. Hello, everybody. My name is Richard McGrady. I'm curator of the Scottish Football Museum and also Project Director of Football Memories Scotland. Today I will be looking at the Football Memories Scotland programme, in particular looking at the role of the Football Museum's archives and object-based collection in supporting the national programme. First of all, a quick introduction to the Scottish Football Museum. The Football Museum was launched back in 1994 at Glasgow's Museum of Transport before moving to Hampden Park, Scotland's national stadium, in 2001. 
The Scottish Football Museum is Europe's oldest national football museum and reflects the central place of association football within Scottish popular culture since the late Victorian era. At Hampden Park, we care for a national football collection for Scotland. The objects of the Scottish Football Museum now extend to over 46,000 individual objects. The collections are recognised as being nationally significant by the Scottish Government. Perhaps the most famous and most iconic object in our collection is the original Scottish Cup, which is the oldest national football trophy in the world. The archives of the Scottish Football Museum are substantial in size, with over one million individual documents estimated to be in the care of our collection. These range from letters of correspondence, like the first ever challenge match letter from 1868, through to thousands of individual match tickets, including the match ticket from the world's first official international match from 1872. We have thousands of individual photographs in the collection of the museum charting the history of Scottish football, as well as tens of thousands of individual match programmes. The origins of the Reminiscence programme can be traced back to 2008 and the inaugural meeting of the Scottish Football Heritage Network. This network brought together club historians from across Scotland, and it was at this meeting that the idea of a reminiscence programme was first mooted. The Football Museum thought that it was a great idea, and we endeavoured to take this proposal forward. We were successful in securing funding from Museums Gallery Scotland, and in June 2009, Hibernian and Scotland legend Laurie Riley officially launched a one-year pilot project. Laurie can be seen pictured alongside myself and Robert Craig, chair of the Football Museum. He also appeared in the first pack of reminiscence cards that we produced. The pilot project centred around four hubs covering Glasgow, Edinburgh, Falkirk and Aberdeen. Each hub was linked to local groups and care homes and provided reminiscence materials and support. At that time, there were no other projects like this for which we could benchmark against. Glasgow Caledonian University were brought in to provide evaluation. The quote that you can see comes from one of the group facilitators who was interviewed in 2009 as part of the evaluation and is one of many examples from the evaluation which demonstrates the positive impact of sports reminiscence on people living with dementia. The quote reads as follows. He kept reaching out his hand for the next photograph, rattling off all of the names and the games, and he laughed and smiled. His wife said it was absolutely amazing. That is the old guy back again. Up to the COVID-19 pandemic, football memories continued to grow over the past 11 years in a sustainable manner due to a network of partnerships at local, regional and national level. Today, Football Memories continues to be coordinated at national level through the Scottish Football Museum with core support from Alzheimer's Scotland. Due to the size of the programme, we are moving to a regional model with regional coordinators to provide additional support. Of the 42 Scottish professional football clubs, 30 are currently involved in the Football Memories programme. We support groups in a variety of environments covering communities and the care sector. We feature in the Scottish Government's National Dementia Strategy under Commitment 13 for dementia-friendly communities. By March 2020, Football Memories had 230 registered groups. Of those, 100 were community-based groups. 130 were care provider groups, that's groups operating out of care homes, daycare centres and hospitals. Our project reach was approximately 2,500 participants per year. And the geographical reach was truly national, running from Stranraer to the Shetland Isles. Football Memories operates a membership system. New groups starting up get access to reminiscence resources. This includes packs of cards, DVDs and training guides. Volunteers have access to reminiscence training, either at Hampden Park in Glasgow or at other venues across Scotland. Group facilitators have access to over 7,000 digitised images from the digital archive. Our groups get up to four free visits to the Scottish Football Museum in Hampden Park each year. 
Volunteers have access to conferences and seminars at Hamden Park and our groups get a top up of reminiscence resources as and when new materials are created. The image at the top of this slide relates to the visit of Ian Dyer and Bishop Briggs Football Memories to Hamden Park in 2019. Sadly, Ian passed away just a few months ago, but in 2019 he came to Hamden Park and was reunited with the Scottish Junior Cup, 57 years after he had first lifted the cup with Kirkintilloch Rob Roy. We provide reminiscence training for a wide variety of people connected to the programme, from individual volunteers connected to football club community trusts through to staff members at care homes and hospitals. The images on this slide relate to a training programme involving the Glasgow City Health and Social Care Partnership. Over the course of two sessions, 48 members of staff from this organisation received football memories training. The image at the top left hand corner is at the beginning of the session as staff members are acquainted with the reminiscence resources and the bottom right hand image relates to the end of the session as staff are presented with their certificates. We are fortunate to have access to some great facilities at Hamden Park and we organise seminars and conferences for volunteers and group facilitators. The biggest one to date was the National Convention, which took place on the 8th of November 2018. We welcomed 180 registered delegates from across Scotland to this convention. There were 12 different presentations. We also had workshops and discussion groups. The whole day was a fantastic networking opportunity for all the people involved, and it was also an opportunity to provide some additional resources. The Scottish FA has been hugely supportive of the Football Memories programme since the early years and in 2015 they secured funding from UEFA to support Football Memories groups at senior football grounds across Scotland. The Football Museum was able to access our archives to create special packs of cards for each of the participating clubs. I will now introduce some of the reminiscence resources which are available to participating groups in the Football Memories programme. The image in the top right hand corner of this slide is a typical starter pack for a new group and includes three packs of reminiscence cards, two DVDs which are made up of film clips from our collections as well as a training guide. Our digital archive has over 7,000 images available for group facilitators. This enables facilitators to personalise reminiscence for individuals in each group. For example, if one individual in a group has an interest for John Sorensen, the Danish international striker who played for Greenwich Morton and Rangers during the 1960s, the facilitator just needs to access the digital archive, search for John Sorensen, locate his image and it is ready to print off for the next reminiscence session. The Scottish Government have been very supportive of the Football Memories programme and in March 2018 they provided funding to support the launch of the Memory Box project. This project lasted one year and created 50 memory boxes for groups across Scotland. The image in the bottom left hand corner shows the content from one of our boxes. The map of Scotland on the right hand side shows the distribution of the 50 boxes to different parts of Scotland. This project was very successful and we have continued to roll out memory boxes and by March 2020 had created 76 boxes. This slide provides a list of objects which appear in our memory boxes. A pack of laminated images from our archives are also supplied as they link into each of the objects in the box. Some of the objects can be picked up and viewed, for example the old football with the laces whilst other objects like carbolic soap and the liniment oil scent cube can be sniffed and bring back evocative memories of games from many years ago. In 2017, Museums Gallery Scotland funded a project called The Game We Used to Play. In this project, we interviewed 36 participants in groups across Scotland and their memories went into the museum's oral history archive. 14 of these memories featured at the heart of an exhibition within Hamden Park and we provided a range of objects and archives to complement each of the memories within the exhibition. Over the years we have created a wide range of partnerships and this has led to some innovative funding campaigns. Probably the most memorable one was in 2013 when we partnered up with Anne Hill to raise funds for Alzheimer's Scotland and the Football Memories Project. 
and contacted quilting fraternities from across the UK and even as far away as Annapolis in the USA. 3,000 quilts were donated to the funding project and you can see the quilts laid out on the Hamden Park pitch. All these quilts were later sold with many thousands of pounds raised which went towards football memories and other dementia related projects. Another memorable funding campaign came in 2017 when Jim McIntosh, the poet in residence at St Johnson Football Club, along with other like-minded poets, created a book of football poetry called Mind the Time. This book not only raised funds for football memories, but was a fantastic vehicle for promoting the project across Scotland. Football Memory Scotland is a game leader organisation with a new national association called Scottish Para Football. Scottish Para Football launched officially at Hamden Park in 2019 and provides a meaningful voice for people in Scotland living with a disability. Already this has led to exciting new partnerships and at the moment Football Memories and Team United are working together on an exhibition at Hamden Park. This will bring together young people living with autism and elderly football fans living with dementia. As a game leader organisation with Para Football Scotland, we are committed to supporting physical activity within the Football Memories programme. Over the last few years, we have supported Alzheimer's Scotland to deliver a range of walking football events within Hamden Park Stadium. Over the years, the Scottish Football Museum has engaged with a variety of intergenerational projects and moving forward with Football Memory Scotland, this is something we would like to develop even further. Already we are looking to develop new reminiscence materials which will support intergenerational activity within the Football Memories programme. An exciting development within the last few years has been Glasgow's success in becoming a host city for UEFA Euro 2020. With the UEFA celebrating 60 years of the European Championships, there was a strong heritage element to the bid process and the Scottish Football Museum was involved in Glasgow's bid. The first few pages of the bid document celebrate the heritage and the passion of football in Glasgow and in Scotland. Football Memory Scotland is an official partner in the Euro 2020 Legacy Programme and whilst the COVID-19 pandemic prevented us from having a formal launch earlier this year, we are ready to roll out the programme from next year onwards. We have created 230 activity packs which will go out to our groups across Scotland with a capacity to create 1,000 in total over the next eight years. We also have created 200 volunteer shirts and these will go out to our groups across Scotland. And finally, we have created an exhibition at Hamden Park which will launch in March of next year. The COVID-19 pandemic had a profound effect on the Football Memories programme with the closure of all groups during March 2020. In reaction to this, we moved to digital platforms and started to create two weekly reminiscence publications, the Football Special and the Pictorial Souvenir. On this slide, you can see an example of the Pictorial Souvenir, which was issued each Thursday. Moving forward, we are now entering a period of transition and by December of this year, we plan to have a long-term digital strategy, which will include a digital magazine and an audio newspaper. Both of these resources will be issued on a weekly basis. This slide provides an example of the Football Special, a reminiscence publication which we published each week on a Monday evening. Feedback from group volunteers and from Alzheimer's Scotland staff were very positive with respect to these publications and moving forward we will be looking to use our archives on a long-term basis to support such publications. Even though the pandemic stopped groups from meeting up, a network of volunteers and Alzheimer's Scotland staff continued to provide amazing support for elderly people isolated at home. This includes football club community trusts who went out to visit members of their groups providing reminiscence resources, Alzheimer's Scotland staff who delivered reminiscence resources to individual households and published the Football Memories publications online, and there were even fundraising events, for example, with Newmarket United Juniors, who raised £2,000, which was split between the Access Centre and the Football Memory Scotland project locally up in Aberdeenshire. Another example of the type of support that we have received over the last few months comes from the Falkirk Herald. 
This newspaper includes the football special in print format on a weekly basis, which will have supported lots of elderly people in the local area living in social isolation. Thank you for taking the time today to listen to this presentation. I hope that it has provided an insight into the development of football memories since 2009 and emphasised the importance placed on archives and object-based collections within the Reminiscence programme. I think that film very much uh, summed up a lot of what was being said by our previous speakers um, and also uh, it's fantastically filmed um, and it's a very short film that we can actually show in, uh, on Twitter as well. So you may have seen, some of you may have seen that already um, when promoting this event. So we've heard the case studies um, today, this morning, if you like. And um, what we're going to do now is I think we all probably need to have a break. Um, but what uh, you can do once you've had your cups of tea um, is to take part in the quiz. So what we're going to do is it's on a loop. So we're going to show some questions. Um, this has been made by Hugh Dan McClellan. And then for the second part of the uh, comfort break, we'll give you the answers. I'm afraid there's no prizes. It's just the fun of taking part. Um, but um, I also encourage you all to use the Q&A button and I'm sure our presenters um, will be on hand to answer any of your questions. So uh, please excuse, there may be a short delay as we upload the quiz, uh, but otherwise we will come back at 5 to 12 um, to start the second section. Uh, it doesn't give us a huge amount of time and we're going to be then hearing from Richard Haynes from the University of Stirling and we're going to be hearing from Charlie Fairley who is from the charity Life Changes Trust and uh, about funding and sustainability and then Michael White um, we're delighted to say is going to be sort of summarising everything that's um, been said today and we'll be hearing his um, talk as well then we will go into a live Q&A session um, and we very much hope you can participate in that. So I'm going to switch my video off and go on to mute and hopefully you can see the um, quiz questions coming onto your screen. Hello everyone, um, welcome back. I hope you've all managed to get your cup of tea um, and have a break. Um, interesting to know how you got on with um, the quiz. 
Um, I know I find some of them quite tricky. I didn't get the hurling one. I thought, of course, Shinty, but it wasn't. It was hurling. Um, so uh, please let us know how you got on with the quiz in the using the Q and A box. Um, it'd be really good to hear, get some feedback from that. Uh, we are going to continue now um, on to the second part of um, our webinar today. And our next speaker is Professor Richard um, Haynes, who is Associate Dean for Research in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities and Professor of Media Sport at uh, University of Stirling. Um, he's held that post since 2013. Uh, but in his early career, I must mention that Richard, um, when he was at Manchester Mo Metropolitan University, he created the largest collection of football fanzines in the world, and it's now held in the National Football Museum in Manchester. So Richard also uh, works closely with the, the Stirling University's archivist um, Carl McGee and with Team Scotland to conserve and publicly exhibit their archive. Today, he's going to talk about his research um, around sport heritage. So thank you. Hello, my name is Richard Haynes from the University of Stirling, and it's a pleasure to be part of this webinar series on sharing the memories of sport at the Being Human Festival. Um, today, I'm going to talk about community archives, reminiscence and well-being, a research agenda, um, based on my research around sports heritage. Before I go on to talk about the research agenda around sport reminiscence and sport collections, I thought it might be useful to say a little bit about my own personal experience or relationship with sports collections themselves. So from a very early age, I was socialised into a love of sport. I played sport, I watched sport. Um, but I also became quite an avid collector of bubblegum cards, of panini stickers and match day programmes and the like. Uh, and many of which I've, I've kept into my older, older years. And during the early phase of the pandemic, this became quite a useful um, material, if you like, to share with friends uh, online and reminisce about players and former games and so on. And that really brought home the value to me of why sport collections really matter, because it does connect people in some interesting ways. I was also very lucky in my early days as an academic researcher to work on a project on football fanzines at Manchester Metropolitan University, where we tried to collect at least one copy of every single title of football fanzines at the time. Uh, which was no minor undertaking, I have to tell you. Uh, there were hundreds, if not thousands of them at the time. Um, and so we collected and amassed quite a large archive within Manchester. But after leaving that post, I had no idea what happened to it until recently. And somebody told me that um, it moved to the National Football Museum in Manchester as part of their collection. And again, that emphasised to me the value of collecting, of, of building archives themselves, which require work and require people to hold on to stuff and not throw it away, um, but also with a, a purpose, perhaps. Um, so it's great news that that now is held by our national collection um, in Manchester and um, will hopefully be of immense value to future researchers and, and anybody interested in football fans and culture. More recently, I've been working quite closely with Commonwealth Games Scotland or, or Team Scotland, which is the organisation that um, organises the team for the Commonwealth Games, formerly the British Empire Games from the 1930s. And that archive has amazing stories of athletes and travelling to games over the years, um, as well as very colourful outfits and, and um, materials of different kinds. And in 2014, we created an exhibition called Hosts and Champions, which was part of the festival for the games in Glasgow, uh, which we then subsequently traveled around the country to about 17 or 18 different venues. And one of the interesting things about that was in, within the, the provincial venues was the localized stories of what the Commonwealth Games meant to people, um, whether as v visitors to the games in Glasgow, uh, or to previous games in Edinburgh, um, or as athletes representing Scotland at previous games. 
uh, and sharing those stories that became really important um, as part of the kind of the event if you like of the host and champions exhibition so again the the intangible value of material things um, is another aspect of um, sports collections which i've learned through working with them and sharing them and this all leads to kind of an initial question of why do we need research on community sports archives what's its purpose and who will benefit and hopefully my own personal experience gives you a bit of a clue on that so why do community sport collections matter well, i suppose crucially sports clubs across the uk hold a wealth of materials related to their past minute books photographs trophies rolls of honor even film they collectively form a key repository of our cultural heritage as a nation. They also provide or represent what we might call the long residuals of sport, providing traces of people, places, practices and artefacts from our sporting past. And through such materials, we are able to textually and visually explore the meaning of sport in communities. They connect us to the important cultural values and an understanding of why sports matters in certain communities and in certain places. So what do we know about sport reminiscence? A key dimension of how sport heritage and collections have been used over the past decade or so has been their use within sport reminiscence. They are triggers for people's memories of the place of sport in their life stories. Sport can be central to people's identities. It creates memories for better or worse, and most importantly, connects people to wider social networks. For this reason, sport reminiscence has become a useful medium for connecting older people together, and through shared experience, can also connect them to intergenerational connectivity with younger people. The experience of sport reminiscence, as we have heard from other presenters in this series, has proven an incredibly potent way of improving social inclusion, engaging disadvantaged groups, particularly with cognitive and physical impairments, and generally improving the well-being through a sense of community, of belonging and identity. Sport heritage, therefore, is crucial, I suppose, in the way in which people gain pride and enjoyment from their love of sport and connects people in a relaxed and familiar way. The emotional value of sport reminiscence, particularly in the ways it connects people and draws them out of isolation, has been recognised in a number of academic studies. For example, work done by a group at the University of West of Scotland provided strong evidence for how sporting memories impacted on loneliness. For them, to quote, loneliness is a common experience within long-term care and to promote well-being and the quality of life among people with dementia, it is important to draw upon a repertoire of strategies that provide social stimulation, companionship and enjoyment. They go on, group-based football reminiscence interventions are feasible in a variety of long-term care settings, including nursing homes, daycare and community care, and have the potential to bring people with dementia together to enjoy a shared meaningful activity. So we can see from this existing and if limited research that sport collections have the ability to transcend cognitive barriers created by a disease like dementia to reconnect people with their own life experience and with others. My own work on intergenerational sport heritage also recalls the social and communal dimensions of sport reminiscence activities and we have a poster there on the left hand side of the screen which was part of that project here in McClysdale Cricket Club in Glasgow where a group of young people met uh, kind of a, an elder member of the club and he showed them artifacts and archives based on the club's history of going back over 150 years. And this research, in a, in a small way, as a small pilot study, showed the value of sport heritage in the community. Um, and it also linked at that time to the upcoming 2014 Commonwealth Games in the city. So sport was at the forefront of people's minds. 
The intergenerational method that I used in that research provides evidence that the added sense of connection and meaning can be created in local sports heritage projects and that bringing people together from different ages and different backgrounds together under a kind of cohesive umbrella or medium of sport um, is really helpful. The research produced some initial findings about how sport heritage provides a context for different generations to work together, to learn together and to socialise and with each in order to develop better understandings of both place, their locality, of social ability, of how we get along, of the importance of sport within culture and the community and of sharing ideas and experiences with, um, across the age groups. Of course the ability to conduct um, sport reminiscence uh, and indeed research into this area has been heavily affected by the pandemic. So what are the challenges for sport reminiscence and how we can overcome them? And the first is that sense of isolation that we've all experienced um, during the lockdown. So this has led to a number of significant challenges um, that sport reminiscence has had to overcome and um, the sport heritage sector more broadly. Sport and cultural venues have been closed. There's a lack of archival access, a lot of material not digitised and unavailable. There's a lack of social connectivity, of the ability to meet people um, and it's a social distance which is not always conducive to interactivity. And also where materials are digitised, there is still the barrier of digital poverty so both in terms of people's competences to use technologies, but also the cost of them. So these things have all stacked up to um, work against um, the ability of sport reminiscence to continue during the pandemic. Future research therefore needs to address a number of important questions to mitigate these challenges. First of all, we need to explore the value of community sport collections themselves. Who have they of value to and why? We need to explore appropriate technologies to deliver digital sport reminiscence materials through standard online resources, text, image, sound and video, through the development of apps or games using virtual reality or augmented reality experiences. We might also think about smart speakers as a form of artificial intelligence to connect people through sound archives and sporting memories through oral histories, for example. We also need to explore the role sport reminiscence can play in bringing together physical and cognitive health and well-being. Conjoining the two has a very powerful and potent way of improving people's well-being and extending their lives. And finally, we need to explore the intergenerational dimensions of sport reminiscence for healthy ageing, both for older people in terms of sharing their knowledge and experience of sport with younger people, but also for younger people who will understand what it is like to grow old and the benefits of understanding that ageing is a natural process and one that we can manage. I hope this short presentation has given you some food for thought and showcased the amazing opportunities available through sport collections to promote healthier ageing for us all. Thank you and goodbye. Now, uh, it's great to have you back actually. Um, I think Richard has um, actually brought up quite a lot of questions, um, things that you might actually want to bring up in the Q&A box. Um, please do post your questions and I will encourage the panellists, our speakers to answer your questions um, in the Q&A box, but we will be having an opportunity um, to actually have the panellists, you'll be able to see them and ask them questions um, a bit later on today. So we're cracking on actually, and we're going to be hearing now from Charlie Fairley. Um, he is the Senior Funding Officer at Life Changes Trust. That's a charity that invests in and supports the empowerment and inclusion of three groups. So young people with experience of being in care, people living with dementia and unpaid carers 
of those with dementia. So one of the ways it does this is through funding projects and it offers awards of £500 to £5,000 to people with dementia or unpaid carers of people who have dementia. So Charlie is part of the People Affected by Dementia programme and prior to joining the Life Changes Trust, Charlie worked for 10 years at the Big Lottery Fund and there he gained experience of the funding sector and supported a number of organisations to undertake a range of different projects. So Charlie um, has lots of experience with funding and we'll be able to answer your questions later, but let's hear from him now. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to start giving a bit of background information on Life Changes Trust. We are a charity that invests in support, inclusion and empowerment for three groups. Young people with experience of being in care, people living with dementia and unpaid carers. We were created in 2013 with a 10 year 50 million endowment from the National Lottery Community Fund. We use this money to bring transformational change to young people with care experience and individuals with dementia and those that care for them. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we are having to close the trust a year earlier than was expected, which will now be in 2021, which I will discuss later on. My presentation will be on the dementia programme, as that is my job role. As Life Changes Trust has a finite existence as a funder, we have always encouraged groups to look for a level of sustainability with regards to projects. This occurs at the application stage, where there are questions around sustainability and collaboration. Life Changes Trust uses a strength-based approach in funding in that it wants those proposing projects to use what assets and strengths are already available within a community, town or village. It wants people and services to work together for the benefit of everyone. This approach is paramount to establishing the dementia-friendly communities we have funded. It is about making sure those with experience of dementia in their community are heard and their views taken on board so that activities and services are geared towards their needs. It is hoped that by the community getting on board and understanding more about dementia and its impact on people and families, there will be more resilience to creating places and spaces that are either or both dementia friendly and dementia enabling. So this could be considered sustainability that is not strictly in the financial sense. It is more about a lasting legacy where being dementia friendly is just normal. Part of the funding process the Trust uses is to have those who have experienced dementia on the decision panels for applications. This is a unique feature as it enables these people to give their thoughts and recommendations along with their knowledge. They have lived with the disease and or cared for someone with dementia. As a funding officer, I and my manager are more there as representatives of the Trust. We provide information about the projects but ultimately leave the final decisions to the panel. It is fantastic to see this process in action. The, decisions, the decision meetings I've been part of have allowed me to learn so much more about dementia, which then improved my understanding of what applicants need to show with regards to running activities and services. I should also point out that those involved in the panel decision meetings are paid for for their contribution, which the Trust also thinks is highly important. There are many cases where people with dementia are asked to participate or contribute to some sort of event conference or report and are not prepared for their work. Life Changes Trust created a befriending and peer support programme in 2015, which funded 13 projects for five years. Two did have to close early. However, as part of the contract of funding, each group had to find and show match funding. Our funding was reduced over the five years, the requirement and match funding was increased. It was hoped that this would give the groups enough time to try and establish their activities and services for the long term. These projects are now coming to an end, so it is difficult to gauge the future of them. However, for all of our funding programmes, we have brought in external evaluators to create reports on the successes and challenges faced by the project. These reports will be for public consumption and go towards the Trust's own legacy policy. It is about showing how, for example, dementia-friendly communities work and what are the ways these can be created. Obviously, there is no one-size-fits-all approach, but it does highlight the ways in which these communities can be embedded. There are several resources like this on the Trust website. The Trust wants to make its own work sustainable, if you will, and doesn't see the closing of the Trust as the end of this work. It is about being part of something bigger and shifting thinking about dementia and making sure the voices of those living with dementia and unpaid carers are heard. 
An example of a successful befriending project would have to be the Eric Little Centre in Edinburgh. And they were given a grant to run a number of dementia activities, like lunch clubs, support sessions and activity groups. The Eric Little Centre has been a valuable asset in the Morningside area of Edinburgh for a number of years, but this grant has enabled the organisation to become not only a hub for dementia support and awareness, but has also teamed up with a local university and has become something of a place for students to learn about dementia and undertake research. This is not to say that the Eric Little Centre is fully sustainable. It obviously still requires funding to run, but the links with other service providers in the area and even local supermarkets and other businesses go some way to creating inclusive communities and providing a level of sustainability. Another feature of sustainability is our learning events. <clears throat> Pre-COVID, these were physical events where we would bring projects together, usually around a theme, like dementia-friendly communities. This meant that the organisations could learn from each other, discuss challenges and look at what works well. There would also be presentations from our projects, showing the progress they have made. Due to COVID, these have now become virtual events. We recently had one that was on technology and dementia. This is just another example of how the Trust works with our funded groups to try and bring a level of support and sustainability. These events are co-produced with some of the groups and there is also a good deal of collaboration with those involved. A good example of both funding and sustainability with regards to the Trust is the regional events we have been undertaking. Before COVID, we had set out to have such an event in each of the NHS areas in Scotland. Again, these were physical events which were planned with partners, organisations and individuals living in that area. There was a great deal of planning involved and the Trust would start the process two or three months, if not longer, before the event itself was due. The event took place over one day, but there were sessions leading up to that day. For example, we would run storytelling sessions for people affected by dementia and unpaid carers. <clears throat> this was a way to find out what issues were important for these people living in that area. We would draw out themes from these sessions and use this information on the day of the event. These themes would be discussed in breakout sessions and feedback from these sessions would be written up and sent to groups and relevant partners. Again, there would be presentations and examples of what some of our funded projects had been doing in that area. The point of these events was that it was specific to that area. So, for example, public transport was a big issue for rural areas. It was also about seeing what strengths lay in that area and how these could be used to improve the lives of those living with dementia. Again, this is looking at services collaborating and trying to become sustainable for those most in need. This also comes from learning together and creating partnerships between different groups. On the back of these regional events, we then ran a small grants funding programme specific to that NHS area called Creating Better Lives In. These were grants up to 15,000 for 12 to 18 months and were eligible for individuals or grassroots organisations to undertake activities in their area. An example would be Shinty Memories Scotland project. This followed on from an event to highlight that those who live in that area know best and can make the most impact. Another feature was that we had a local person who was best placed to become a network coordinator for all the projects. This is so that the projects can again learn from each other and work together when necessary. This will hopefully bring about sustainability and legacy for the project. Again, it is about raising awareness of dementia in these areas and trying to make dementia friendly and dementia enabling part of the normal. Having these meetings has obviously been hard to undertake during COVID. However, it is about overall legacy work and that people experience dementia do not feel isolated or left behind. We will be announcing our last five remaining areas for funding next year. These will be Forth Valley, Glasgow, Lanarkshire, Shetland, Dumfries and Galloway. As mentioned earlier, the Trust itself has also a collection of resources on its website, which will form part of its legacy and sustainability work. A couple of examples of this are Dementia, a whole life project, this is a sort of box set of documents that has been collated and written with the groups we have funded. These cover such ideas as community and dementia and peer support and cite examples of good practice. The other example is a book we commissioned called Loud and Clear, which covers two decades of dementia activism in Scotland. 
It tells the stories of people living with dementia in Scotland that were activists for improvement in dementia support, among other things. There is also a handy tips book that goes along with it. These examples show that the trust relationship with projects is not just the funder and the fundee. <clears throat> it is about a mutual respect and giving organisations and people a platform where they can take the lead and tell their stories. It is also about making lasting resources that can support and provide information when required. Again, this goes back to legacy and sustainability. It should also be mentioned that the trust takes and advocates a person-centred approach. This allows for empowerment for the individual. Obviously, COVID has made an impact on sustainability and legacy. For example, the trust was due to finish in March 2022, but we have had to bring this forward to 2021. This decision was made due to the money we had left and the impact of COVID on it. It was decided that the remaining money should be used for our beneficiaries, including evaluation, legacy and sustainability work. This has meant that our legacy and evaluation work is now in full force so that we can meet our new deadline. We have already undertaken a number of online events, one, that's, one that was specifically around COVID. This allowed projects to both highlight their concern, but also demonstrate how they have managed to adapt to the restrictions. It was great to hear some of the stories on how groups have still managed to support people. From this, we then compiled a COVID-19 report, which is another of our, of another of our resources. We have also pressing ahead with our regional events, which will now be online and also launching our evaluation reports with online learning events. For example, we will be exploring our dementia and ethnic minorities communities work. It is safe to say that our emphasis is now on putting a legs in place and that there is a level of sustainability for this work, along with a better understanding of dementia. I just want to say thank you for listening to my presentation and please feel free to visit our website for more information. So that was a very interesting talk um, from Charlie about funding um, and I'm sure people are going to have lots of questions um, for him a bit later on. Uh, so sad to say that we're actually going on to our last presentation. Um, it's from Michael White, director at Screen Memories. Uh, that's an organisation that uses film still images, memorabilia and selected film extracts to provide structured experiences to stimulate recall, boost self-esteem and confidence for people who are living with dementia and other memory problems. Um, before this, Michael managed the National Football Memories Project. So he also developed uh, the Football Reminiscence Project with the Scottish Football Museum and Alzheimer's Scotland. So now he is working to develop and support groups across the country. Um, this includes training volunteers in film reminiscence techniques and coordinating activities and resources for use in sessions. Uh, so Michael is going to summarise today. Um, you probably heard his name mentioned in a lot of the talks um, that we heard earlier. So he's going to look at how archives and heritage can help people with dementia, as he calls them, a forgotten generation. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Michael White. And I would like to show you this afternoon how archives and heritage materials can play a key role in helping a forgotten generation. If you have a good look at this building, I wonder if you can tell me what is the main use of the building? At first glance, you may think it is just a rugby clubhouse, but in fact, you could argue a very strong case that it is all of these put together. Here is um, a dad, a former player, coming to a rugby memory session with his daughter. And she told us that he lit up as soon as they were getting near the ground because it brought back happy memories for him. During the session, we used archive material from rugby to bring back happy memories of his own time as a player. And he knew he was amongst friends and people who had shared similar experiences. He had played rugby at the highest level for Scotland. And for these couple of hours, he was back in his element in the happiest time of his life. 
If we look at the range of materials that are available to us, they would encompass all of these. And it's not just written material and photographs, but it's everything on that list and more, including smells as well, and real objects like jerseys and boots. And some of the stories that emerge once these materials trigger the memories are fascinating. And some of the stories haven't appeared in any of the textbooks. Some of the materials have never been seen before. They've been in family albums and they trigger memories of trips to away grounds, trips down to Wales or Ireland or England. And sometimes collections in an album of cigarette cards can recall people who lived in the town or the village many, many years ago. And it's not uncommon for a father or a grandfather or some other relative to emerge from a long lost collection of team pictures. The picture on the left was brought in by the son of one of the policemen there. And at first glance, you would think the two policemen are trying to apprehend the man in the front of the picture. But in fact, it was a day when there was almost a disaster at this football ground, where a goal for the away team had caused a surge forward and crash barriers had buckled and fleets of ambulances had to take the injured to the local hospital. It was a day where there was almost some real tragedy and it was all forgotten. It's never referred to in any of the books, but it was a very powerful memory that came about from the use of this archive. It's really good to see that lots of sports clubs are setting up heritage trusts to try and keep the private collections for future generations and to open them up for researchers and for schools and colleges. A very powerful partnership would be the professional archivist linking up with these enthusiastic local fans and supporters and doing something to preserve the collections. Many of them are beginning to fade away and may need remedial action. But applying the archives for other purposes than just history can be a very, very useful thing indeed. As an example of this, um, a guy brought in this picture on the right of a visiting Israeli football team. And it triggered memories of his own national service in what was then Palestine and his return to the area after the setting up of the new Israel. And he had the most vivid recollection of the country and the customs, and all triggered off by this one memory. Well, that's a saying I think that we could well have applied to what happened to us with COVID. Just before the outbreak of the pandemic, Scotland had a, a place as the, perhaps the leading um, area for applying sport as a reminiscence activity. And visitors from America were astounded at the number of groups we had over here over 200, while in the whole of the USA there were about four or five. But the lifeblood of all our work was really in face-to-face -face work with people in community settings or in care homes or in hospital wards. And the potential for expansion was enormous from football memories. We'd branched out into other sports, and you've heard about some of them this morning, and Speedway were coming involved. The clubs themselves were delighted to be involved in our programmes and they had made their premises and the staff available to us. And this was a great trigger when the people could come in to the sports stadiums and see the archives that were there on the walls. And we started to link in reminiscence to sports related activity, walking football, walking rugby. And this could be applied to shinty, and golf and other sports. One of the biggest impacts the sports related activity made on me personally was seeing this old guy, age 96, a former Spitfire pilot, who we set up a small golf course in a farmer's field just outside Lockerbie. And he could hardly stand or walk unaided by, by his carer, but when he had a golf club in his hand and he stood quite erect and the motor, the motor memory kicked in, 
He addressed the ball and he hit the ball consistently far, much further than I could. And it was all because he was in a familiar context and something had kicked in. Covid has been very much, as they say, a game changer, but it's brought some in increased opportunities as well. Lockdown had a huge focus on nostalgia and looking backwards and memories. And with the, the schedules decimated by the lack of live sport, there were a whole series of things which focused on greatest teams, memories of Olympics, memories of sports. And there was also the focus on what was going on in the care homes and an increasing awareness of the loneliness and isolation in the elderly population. So it made us look at how we could deliver what we wanted to do in different ways. The big problem we had was that the generation we were trying to reach were not by and large a generation who were comfortable with computers or iPads. And we initially put out lots and lots of paper-based newsletters and quizzes, but gradually we started to do online sessions through Zoom. And it meant that we could find carers, we could find family members to help us improve our work across generations. And quite often it was children, it was grandchildren or great grandchildren who could show uh, the relatives how sessions could be delivered via Zoom and iPads. And they could work the technology and just let the older people enjoy what was going on. What we learned then were, first of all, that the hidden archives were enormous. And it's a wee bit like an iceberg. We think we know what is out there, but there's an awful lot more for us to discover. And the importance of still images, I think, is still the, the key to all of it. It's the most effective use of archives, where the person can hold the picture in their hand and they can take as long as they need the carer or the family member can provide encouragement or little triggers or clues. And the whole mood is based on humor, uh, leg pulling essential to the whole process. But the discussion, whether it be on the sport, can lead to all kinds of memories, uh, moments in, in life where memories come out of school, of work, of people, the new places they went. and it is sometimes the sport takes a back seat and other stories just come out and they, they flow. So the COVID outbreak has been a, a real game changer for us, but it might not be a, a negative one. The, the main things we've, we've learned, I think, are when we try to involve sports volunteers, that we don't want what you may class as, as sports anoraks who are obsessed with facts and figures and league tables and results. Uh, it's not a pub quiz and it's all about setting a mood or a tone where memories can be, can be triggered. So I think, as I said earlier, this link between the professional archivist and the sports enthusiast is a crucial one. And the presence of a, a carer or a family member is important. But the other big, big lesson is that the mixing of younger people and older people is very, very powerful. And the younger people can learn far more about the social and economic history of the times from involvement in a memory session than they ever could do um, from a textbook. Well, what do we do from now? I think we're all very realistic that there's going to be a massive pressure on uh, budgets, there'll be staff cuts and unemployment rising, and all of the charities, very worthwhile charities, will all be struggling for very, very limited resources. But I think the increased focus on older people will, will be a, a benefit for us, and a greater awareness of the health benefits of applying archives in a therapeutic way I think will be to, to our benefit. Hopefully, there will be an improvement on the links between NHS and care homes. And my own personal hope is that we may get to a single social care health sector. 
and a bigger assessment of what it means to be an older person. It is far from the stereotypical tweed set and barrels and let's all sing Vera Lynn songs in a care home. Some of the lessons from the, the COVID-19 epidemic have been quite um, game, well, game changing. And I think we hit an all time low with the slogan, which was thankfully quickly ditched, of don't kill granny. But to go and see your relatives in the, in the later stages, or in some cases, end of life, through a closed window was absolutely horrific. And th these are moments that you can't buy back. But through all the horror stories, there were some amazing stories as well, which lifted the spirit. But for, for me, one of the big lessons is that people in care homes today are not all from the World War II generation. And when you go in and hear bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover, you begin to wonder whether some of the activity staff have really got the, the time frames right. Now, here are some older people who are just as old as some of the people we would find in care homes. And I'm sure these older people would be absolutely mortified to see themselves classed in a kind of solitary group of older people. And today you have older people who are climbing Monroe's, who are taking part in walking sports, and they've got a lot more to give. The archives um, link between the professional and the amateur enthusiast, and I include myself in the latter category, were probably best illustrated in this single photograph that a man brought along to one of our sessions. Uh, face value, it's a football team. We could identify the team. We could look at the kit, um, the clothing of the trainer, uh, the watch strap visible, the gold watch and chain, and the, the style of the football. So we could put a date on it. But then you say, well, I wonder what, what, why they were playing on that particular time. And we began to date it. And we found that the local archivist could provide us with material because they were trying to raise money for a pit disaster in a village called Reading, just outside of Falkirk. So this was a charity game to raise funds for a mining disaster. And the archivist could bring along newspaper cuttings, cuttings from the local paper, um, pictures from the national papers of the cars bringing the, the dead to, to the cemetery and the impact it had on the women and children of, of that mining village. So all of these generic memories, time specific, came from a picture of a football team. Where we go now then? Well, let's hope that this is not a, a time limited phenomenon, the, the focus on the elderly. Let's hope that health and social care can be integrated. And let's also hope that people can look at the benefits of applying archives, applying heritage, um, for a therapy, and you'd say to yourself, what would bring more benefit, the pills or the tablets, or human companionship, interaction, and memories? And in my book, and for my personal limited experience, I would argue a very strong case that archives and heritage could probably be more effective. The potential across sport is phenomenal. And the potential for developing this within Scotland, within the United Kingdom, within the world is limitless. We've already seen football groups emerging from uh, the Scottish model in Holland and in Brazil. And in America, we have had visitors come across and they've replicated our programs for baseball. And you can go beyond sport. You can go into areas that I find equally effective such as uh, cinema and the rock and roll music. And uh, all of this, the centre of it is archive material. One of the most important people I ever met doing this kind of work was this old chap on the right, Willie Corbett. 
Willie was in a, an Alzheimer Scotland group in Bowness, and I think it would be fair to say he was a reluctant member. He used to pretend he was fast asleep when the activities coordinator called him through to, to do some communal activity. But through general persuasion and coaxing, through his friend Jimmy on, on the left, we got Willie to join in the football sessions. And what a story emerged. It transpired that Willie had been, in Jimmy's words, no a bad footballer. <laughs> and Willie had played for Scotland as a young 20-year-old against England at Wembley in front of 90,000 people. But because it was during the war, it was classed as an unofficial international. It was the strongest possible team both England and Scotland could have fielded. And you can see there, there were more than a few people in attendance. But because it was a wartime game, it wasn't considered an official international and there were no international caps awarded. We gathered together quite an archive for Willie about his special day, including uh, the programme, the match cuttings and a few pictures. And when Willie was interviewed by a researcher, the lady had her clipboard and she was ready to collect all the facts. Do you like football memories? Aye. What do you like best about football memories? Everything. And despite her best promptings and attempts to draw Willie out, uh, he was just happy to say that he enjoyed everything. And then he came away with this quote. And if you are looking for one sentence, to say, is this worthwhile? This is it. And when Willie said this, I must admit, you know, there was not a dry eye in the house because quite honestly, that says it all. So looking ahead on a personal basis, one day I would like to think that we could ditch a lot of the pills and the tablets and we could have a greater focus on the archives and the memory triggers. So all of you archivists and all of you sports people, regardless, this could be your big moment to prove once and for all that memory triggers through archives can bring more happiness and pleasure than joy than any tablets or pills or medicines. You have it in your own power. So, as a well-known brand of sportswear says, just do it. And maybe we could see a slogan that's a little more humane than the original one. Thank you for listening. Um, well, thank you, Michael. Um, that was a fantastic presentation. Um, and that ends all our presentations for today. But we are going to have a live Q&A session. For the people who are attending, you will see at the bottom of your screen a raise hand icon. If you raise your hand, we will unmute you and you can actually ask the panellists for their, um, um, you can ask the question to the panellists and you will get an answer. Uh, so all the panellists, we're going to turn their videos on and we're going to unmute the panellists. So that's all the speakers from today. And um, as I say, raise your hand and we will unmute you and you can ask a question. Um, I've taken some questions that I have found on the Q&A. And um, oh, I can see Charlie's just run off there. I know he's coming back. Um, I've got uh, a, some questions that I've got from the, the Q&A box. And I'm going to just ask really all the, the panelists, because I think they'll be able to, to help, is um, how easy is it to attract volunteers to help? Um, that was particularly about golf, actually, so that's maybe Lorraine. But also, have you got any advice for people to, wanting to volunteer in the community sports heritage sector? Maybe we could start with Lorraine, because the first question was actually about golf. And from our perspective, using the local golf clubs is a, your best starting point because th through their membership, they, they are keen golfers and they have a, a ready pool of people who may be in a position to, uh, to volunteer. And also, I think most golf clubs, the, the size of their senior membership is greater <coughs> than the junior membership. So they 
are potentially in a better position to consider volunteering. Sorry, you're muted, Audrey. Trying to unmute my sorry, I'm unmuting myself, pressing my button. I'd quite like to ask the same question to Richard, just because I know that in your presentation you asked, um, you mentioned a lot about volunteers. You will have to unmute, yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of the Football Memories Programme, it's actually similar to what Lorraine just mentioned there in terms of kind of building up groups. Uh, rather than reinventing the wheel, you, you can look out there, uh, uh, you know, and look at existing organisations who have the capacity to support a, pro a programme like uh, Football Memories. So a lot of the football clubs have been very important for us. Um, they're great for profile as well. Uh, most a lot of fans uh, may well come forward and volunteer to help out uh, when they find out that there's a, the local club is running a Football Memories group. Um, so we've, we've kind of built up the, the programme over a long period of time, um, basically by, by reaching out to organisations that, that are already there initially and uh, and taking off from there. More recently, um, because we have been able to build up a bit of a, a volunteer pool ourselves, we've now been looking to, to create more uh, groups in communities, uh, particularly library groups. So there's quite a number of sprung up in Glasgow area and Lanarkshire, for example. Um, but for us, yeah, it's all about not reinventing the wheel. It's about um, reaching out to organisations who already exist and, and, and working in partnership with them. OK, no, that's thank you very much for that. Um, another question I, I found actually was COVID um, accepted. Uh, what has been the biggest challenges you faced um, setting these groups and projects up? Um, maybe from Helen, actually, because you mentioned this in your in your presentation. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the group had already been going for since 2016. It started a few years ago um, and Hugh Dan and Michael White were very involved in that. And then I got involved about a year ago, just over a year ago. Um, but we, it, you know, it still was very early days, I would say, in setting up the group and, and getting it going with regular activities, because what had happened before had been... Um, you know, some activities had happened, but they were maybe uh, few and far between. And so really the, the focus for this year was getting things um, more regular and a kind of sustainable route to move. Because, it because you know, the partnership with the museum is an 18 month project. We have actually got an extension for another few months, which is great. There was a bit of an underspend. And so we've been able to continue it to the end of March, which gives us a bit more time to kind of go forward with some legacy planning um, and the work that we're doing in the group is kind of setting things up so that people can run with it more in the future. Okay, um, maybe uh, we could ask Murray the same question actually. Well, it's, it's always difficult to get volunteers, but I find uh, what we found the, the snowballing technique the best uh, where you meet with people after a game of, of rugby and talk about it and then find out who they think might also be interested in helping you. But at the moment, we can't do that. Um, and uh, But we're very lucky in Hoyt because, like I guess it is in Canusti, uh, it's a very strong local community. Uh, and I'm amazed. At who knows who? Everybody seems to know everybody else. Uh, and it word quickly spreads that we're looking for help. And in fact, when we, I mean, we have got, um, it's about four, 400 boxes, archive boxes uh, of materials from the rugby club and uh, Bill McLaren. And when it became known that we needed help in cataloging those, researching information about those, um, I was actually very surprised and to be inundated with help. And, and one of the things I had to do, ironically, was to actually dampen expectations because people were coming to me and saying, you've no idea what I've got in my granny's attic. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's just lots and lots of material in back bedrooms all over the place. And we're not ready to accept that yet. So in a funny sort of way, um, while finding volunteers is difficult, it can be problematic when you get people coming to you with, with materials, when you're not in a position to handle them properly. Ah, okay. Not a very that... helpful answer, I suspect. 
no, that's that's great. Um, I, I think it's quite it's definitely quite interesting. It wasn't what I was expecting. I was maybe expecting it was difficult to recruit volunteers. Um, I mean, it was a question that came in from someone who actually is wanting to do more and who is wanting to volunteer. So I would say probably get in touch with the group um, and offer your services. And uh, there might be a waiting list, though, perhaps. I don't know. Um, I have to say there's a, actually a question that's come in and I want to, I haven't seen Neil Stobe raise his hand because he could actually ask this question himself. Um, and if uh, if he does, he can, he just has to, you know, click on that icon at the bottom of the screen. So he's not doing it. So I'm going to ask his question for him and it's directed at Michael. So Michael, the project has come so far since you held your first football memory session in Falkirk in 2004. It now covers a number of sports along with screen and jukebox and has moved to other countries. How do you see it progressing post pandemic? So that's from Neil and that's directed at Michael. Right, I think post pandemic, the emphasis will be more and more or organization training volunteers or training staff members in care homes and hospitals to deliver this. Because I think the likelihood of us as volunteers having access to care homes and hospitals in the near future is, is pretty remote. And I think there's more and more of this kind of work can be done uh, at home where we train people and family members especially to do this on a regular basis, almost on a, a daily, weekly basis as possible. But I think we'll look back on this and see that the, the coming of COVID was quite a turning point, but it's absolutely limitless what, what you can do. I mean, we, we focused on sport today, rightly so. But I think it's a question of saying everybody has a, a box of memories and the skill is trying to find which key opens their particular box. So going forward, if I, if I had a magic wand, I would create a, a sort of national memories, reminiscence, archive, heritage kind of movement um, and try and see that roll out, covering absolutely every aspect of social and economic life. So I've unmuted oh, Neil, actually. Uh, so... Audrey, can I be cheeky and ask a question of Neil Stobie? Well, yes, you can do, because I've unmuted Neil, so he can um, now speak to everyone. So, yes, please do, Murray. Um, ask. You, you kindly mentioned earlier that we just received funding to do some more virtual programmes. One of the things that we want to do in between um, different video clips is to have one minute video selfies from people um, starting off with the words, one of my favourite rugby memories is. And because Neil travels all the way to Glasgow to our meetings in Hoyk, I was planning to ask Neil to do a one minute video selfie for our upcoming virtual rugby memory session. So it's a great opportunity to be able to ask him, not quite face to face, but uh, through the means of Zoom. So Neil, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Neil. Ah, yep. good. Sorry. Um, great rugby memory. Scotland winning the Triple Crown in Dublin in 1984, where my ticket cost £3.50, which is about £3, where you get half a programme for that nowadays, or maybe a packet of mints at a game of rugby. Um, the old Lansdowne Road standing in a packed terracing a ground that would be closed nowadays uh, under health and safety. Fabulous memory. Early memories being taken to Scotland All Blacks, 1964, nothing each draw. And the great memory, sitting with my beloved great uncle, listening to Bill McLaren. And Bill McLaren, I would suggest, has influenced rugby union more than any other commentator, mm. has influenced any other sport and he is a Scottish icon. I have been in New Zealand where I was asked, do you know Bill McLaren? <laughs> and I, I was lucky to have a great chat with David Campese in his shop in Sydney one day about Bill McLaren. And Campese worshipped Bill the way Bill worshipped David Campese. Mm -hmm. but so many sports, so many memories, but yeah. that's my, my great memories of rugby union. 
No, that is great. And has Michael answered your question? Sorry, the one that I... I... Has indeed. Yes. It... Great. Yeah. OK. Thank you. No, I'm going to mute you again. Um, and I do ask if anyone else wants to ask a question, please raise your hand just like Neil did and we will unmute you. Um, other questions that have come in um, to the panel, and I think it's something, it's interesting, I'd, I'd quite like to put this to um, Richard Haynes first, actually, um, from the University of Stirling. Um, and that is, how are all the panellists succession planning to ensure all their work carries on? Um, and if you could start us off on that, just uh, because of uh, the work of the university and how much it has been affected by COVID. Yeah, sure, Audrey. For some reason, I can't unmute my video, but hopefully you can hear me. Um, I, I think, I mean, uh, you know, the fantastic presentations we've seen today um, give us a sense just, I, mean, I, I talked about a national repository and I think Michael's comments about, you know, it's not just sport, it's, it's, it's all things connected with our social life, um, personal and communal. And I think, um, you know, the work that we've done at Sterling through the, mainly the Team Scotland archive. And I suppose the, a good example is the, the Humpty Dumpty um, image that I put up there. That, that was a, a mascot from the 1970 games, which uh, I remember, well, it was a daughter of a, a former administrator gave us after we took our exhibition to Irvine. And, you know, she had no idea what to do with the, her, her dad's collection and um, and kindly contributed it to and deposited it at the University of Stirling. And that was just one of many instances of this happening. Uh, and it, so it sounds like, you know, from what Murray said, and I know from Richard and, and probably Hugh Dan as well, in, in, in their respective sports, this is what, what does keep happening. Once the word spreads and gets out there, people are really keen and willing um, to either get involved or, or donate stuff. And I think, Maybe it's a it's it's a this is a kind of a challenge of of twenty cent twentieth century living in the twenty first century, is there is an awful lot of stuff and this stuff um, resides as we've heard in people's cupboards and attics and uh, weird and wonderful places and when uh, loved ones pass on and, and we when we go through the boxes of photographs and stuff and find amazing and wonderful things, well a lot a lot of the times people don't know what to do with this stuff. Uh, and I think in the past, a lot of it was thrown away, you know, chucked out, never to be seen again. Um, and that, well, that's fine if that's what some families want to do. But I think what we're hearing today is that these things are incredibly potent vehicles. You know, I, I call it a medium, you know, like a media to um, to past worlds, past lives, uh, which just triggers people's memories and connections with people. And it's that uh, the key is the connectivity bit. So how do we sustain this, which is the question. It's, it, it's immensely difficult and frustrating. And I know, again, having you know, heard Michael and others in the past talk about the frustration of funding, and funding is a big issue of, of this, of you know, maintaining and sustaining this activity, which clearly is uh, working. Um, it's doing some amazing um, positive work. And again, I think you know, Michael's slide of the pills and the the... The, the sport image is is really powerful isn't it because you know we want people to live longer and mm. and and um we want in in the community i think this is the, the main challenge and covid has really brought this home hasn't it um you know in the community where carers of people either living with dementia or, or other other illnesses um associated with aging i found it incredibly difficult because of of the you know the the isolation that we felt through this, um, you know, to, to find the right resources to, to do the right thing um, for their loved ones. I mean, I personally went through, you know, with, with my mother-in-law, again, the image of somebody in a care home and you can't touch them and speak to them. I, I have a personal experience of that in the, in the pandemic. And it is truly awful. There's some horrific stories related to this. So the power of archives, the importance of them, for storing them, preserving them, conserving them, um, cataloging them. And again, it's very interesting to hear what Murray said there about, um, you know, community volunteers. And obviously we heard from Lorraine as well about that, I think in terms of golf. Again, it's amazing because of, again, sport as a, as a place, as a space for, for connecting people, 
the willingness of people to support and help each other in this is is a, you know an amazing resource it's a free resource because people you know as we know again particularly in the social care setting a lot of that is done by you know loved ones friends family uh, volunteering their their time and efforts so i think if, if we get the message out there that you know this is worthwhile that it does make a difference that it does change people's lives for the better it can arguably make people live longer uh, which is obviously a good thing and and give you know the, again the different we've heard a lot about different generations connecting with each other this is really important and um and so you know whatever by, by whatever means and mechanisms um, we need this, this the kind of public support in terms of public funding to have the mechanisms to, to make this sustainable. Um, but also we, we do need the sustained investment in, in archives, you know, again, in community libraries um, and, and elsewhere. That, uh, so this stuff doesn't disappear off the map, in a sense, you know, for good. Um, so that, I don't know if that answers the question. There's, I'll, touched on lots of different things there but i think all these things are in, interconnected um but ultimately it is about connecting people um and and um you know their, their kind of life stories in, in really powerful ways which have real real genuine benefits for people no that that's great uh thank you richard i might just ask if charlie from life changes trust as a funder does he want to say anything particularly about that um, well, as I said in my presentation, we've um, done, yeah, we did a whole host of, host of online sessions regarding uh, COVID and the impact um, and how groups have kind of um, tried to adapt to this and um, work through kind of different barriers and stuff. And that report is on our website um, for people to read. It was an inter interesting sessions because obviously there were you know, negatives, but there were many positives regarding uh, the pandemic and how people and communities have coped and as other speakers have been saying, have helped, um, have, have kind of brought the community together to support each other. Um, I mean, a lot of the time, early kind of, at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of the, the services people were providing were obviously online um, and doing kind of um, all sorts of things like quizzes and things online and, and just support sessions online um, as, as it continued. There was more emphasis on um, activity packs, delivering activity packs to people's doors um, and then, or even things like, there was examples of uh, sort of learning like song sheets and learning songs and then people were joining at a kind of group event and sing these songs together and um, so there's okay. lots and lots of examples yep. of of that um, yeah so so that there has been yeah there's been interesting things that have come out of that but um, as I said yeah there's there's a, there is that I mean I think it's on our website but it should be on our website if anyone okay. wants to read that. Thank you very much thanks Charlie is there any of the other panelists um, that we'd like to comment um, on that, um, that have anything we would like to say, please um, unmute. Um, otherwise, could, I will. Could I, um, could I just say something? Uh, uh, yeah. Following up on what Richard said, and, and I touched on it, uh, uh, I didn't want to be uh, seen to be relentlessly negative in any sense in what I was saying, but I did uh, spend some time talking about the opportunities. And I think, you know. <laughs> Richard's point about the resources, whoever has to pay for it, somebody has to pay for some of what we're doing. And it, just this morning, I've, I've just, while the, this has been going on, taken delivery of eight um, boxes of slides from, from the Donald Mackay archive. Now, I mean, there's a simple process here. I can, I can either take all that stuff and put it in the archive where it's going to go, and it will sit there, because nobody, the, the archive doesn't have the resources to actually process it. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to process it ourselves to give it to the archive for safekeeping and management as we go forward. But the physical process of, of and it's, it's what Mary Watson was saying as well, when you have three or four people turn up with carloads of stuff, what do you do? Do you say we can't handle it or do you take it and then it sits there 
unless you've got some mechanism which is resource driven mm. to actually process it all, nothing's going to happen. It's all going to say it might be safe, it might be everything, bomb proof, waterproof, but nothing's happening until somebody physically uh, processes it through the system. And that is, is as we're going forward, I, I said the internal pressure of staffing reviews and all the rest of it, archive systems are under colossal pressure and not able, I don't think, and won't be able to help us as much as they would want to unless they are better resourced. Yeah. Otherwise, and you will all do our bit processing them and banging them the, through the, your slide machines at home and everything else, but then you get into issues of quality control and all the rest of it. It's not the way it should be, but it's the way we're having to operate. And as Richard says, until we're publicly funded, until the archive system, and, and there's maybe, if I can throw a pebble in the, full, in the pool, what's the difference between a museum, a library, and an archive? You know, is there enough coordination between the three, I'll use the word loosely, sectors or, or labels? You know, can we do more to link everybody together to share facilities and... The, I know that staffing levels are going to be a big issue for us going forward, but in terms of sustainability, it's local answers for local situations. Yeah. I think I was... that's a very valid point there because uh, archives are used to collecting paper materials, yeah. uh, increasingly digital materials with all the problems that future proofing is going to bring in, in the future. But what about three-dimensional items? Yeah. Bill McLaren's house was eventually sold uh, about three months ago uh, and his glory hole, his study, which I showed an image of, was just packed full of stuff. Um, uh, and I was able to get most of the paper, the photographs, the program, the books into the archives. But I was stuck with some of the furniture and I was stuck with his wardrobe. I mean, I, his iconic military coat, his iconic um, sheepskin jacket a blazer he wore um, when he travelled on Concord because he's still got the Concord towelette in his pockets. And I mean, every pocket that he has has got two pens and a notepad in it. I put those into a porter cabin in the Hoyt Rugby Club, but it's now getting damp. They're going to disintegrate. So my back bedroom is now Bill McLaren's old wardrobe. <laughs> it is a real problem. <laughs> Um, I want to just add in there, actually, because this is actually quite an issue, uh, because in what we call community archives, um, we don't just have flat objects, we don't just have documents, it does in involve three dimensional objects, quite often trophies, textiles, I think you've been talking about furniture, wood, um, and it is quite an issue because um, archivists tend to catalogue as well differently from a museum or a gallery. It is perhaps a separate webinar, to be quite honest. Um, I don't think we could have it covered here. If there were some uh, professional archivists in the audience, they might be able to shed some light onto this. But it, it is an issue, actually, um, with funding um, as well, because when you take something in, um, how do you look after it and keep it? Um, and, and people do want to save it, actually, to be honest. They don't want to throw it away. That's why they come to community groups like yourself um, to look after it. It is a funding issue, uh, but I think we might need to save that uh, for another for another session, actually. It's, it is very interesting, um, indeed. Um, I don't see anyone else raising their hand. Um, and interestingly enough, because uh, Lucy Jane's actually, who's with us, has asked several questions on the q and and I'm going to have to ask her a question for her unless she raises this or hand. Um, but it's one for Richard, actually, and it is um, for your football memories, the audio newspaper. How will it be created and shared? I think yeah, you've obviously mentioned this. Yes, I, I briefly responded. Um, the, in terms of the, the audio newspaper, what we're doing at the moment, um, and it's a little bit rushed, but what we're doing at the moment is we have a kind of network of volunteers. So we're going to bring together the volunteers to provide the content. Um, and luckily, I have access at the moment to Hamden Park, although it's quite much in lockdown, to access the museum collections. And one of the things we're doing at the moment is we're getting access to uh, the oral history archive that we have. Um, one of my first jobs 21 years ago was going out and interviewing old players. And we were told then the future was mini discs. So unfortunately, everything's in mini disc that we have, but we're, we've got funding to get the mini discs digitised um, from Museums Gallery Scotland. 
And what we're doing at the moment is between the volunteers um, creating content by reading out stories and also then getting hopefully original um, recordings from some of the former players, et cetera, and managers, um, we're going to kind of bring together then a, a, a weekly audio uh, newspaper, which we're going to put into a podcast format. Um, so we've already kind of got ourselves established then um, with a, a, a podcast kind of company. So we'll put up the, the, the newspaper each week and obviously we'll, we'll then provide the links uh, through social media, through the various um, social media channels that we have through the Museum and Football Memories and, and hopefully even the Scottish FA for some of the podcasts, uh, um, some of the newspapers when, when it comes out. And so in that way, that's how we hope then to start to uh, get the wider public uh, knowledgeable about the, this as a resource. We also obviously have a, a huge network of groups already, uh, outside of Scotland, uh, staff, et cetera, as well. Care home industry, there's quite a number of care homes. So again, we can directly contact them to make them available uh, on a weekly basis. Okay, that's great. No. Uh, Michael White actually is going to just add to that. Lovely. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, you know, before we, we, we go, that we, we have a lot of people who are old who are deaf, who are blind, and we need to have a think, or a thought rather, about how we would deal with archives and material for these people. And also the other marker down is we have a lot of people living within the boundaries of Scotland where English is not their first language, mm -hmm. and their memories are from other cultures, other backgrounds, and that's maybe a subject for a future <laughs> session. Um, it, it is actually, uh, I probably, I mean, we could be sitting here for days actually um, discussing this, but that's fine. Um, we have got a little bit of time and it maybe relates as well to um, Lorna Steele has asked a question. Now, Lorna um, uh, is an archivist and she says, how can archives make it known that they are able and willing to give professional advice regarding the storage listing issues around copyright? Um, and if Lorna wants to um, actually ask the question or comment, please raise your hand um, as I say the button is at the bottom of your screen. But perhaps this is a question for the, the people who are actually working, the, the first four presenters um, today. Um, I don't know if Lorraine wants to comment on that to start with. You'll have to unmute Lorraine. Ooh. Yeah, yep. I think it, it's really a very interesting question and one that uh, we would certainly be wanting to look at more closely over you know, the coming months. And but certainly from our perspective, it would be really, really helpful to have even closer engagement mm -hmm. with archivists. And from a golf perspective, we are working very closely with the British Golf Museum and, and the vast array of material that they have available. And that certainly has been very powerful and very helpful to us in, in all that we do. And it's certainly a way that we have to, a pathway we have to, to follow for the future. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask Murray, because I know that you work quite closely with um, Hoyt, the local authority archive. I think it's run by Paul Bruff. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Paul is a fantastic enthusiast uh, and has been very, very helpful indeed. Uh, and we have got very detailed plans about how we're going to go about integrating our stuff into their collection management system and onto their online system, how we're going to did, you know, how we're going to scan and digitize the paper and photographic and program documents and how we're going to physically photograph some of the three dimensional uh, photographs and a number of quite innovative ways to actually provide access to people. Um, all over the world 24 7 um, but I mean uh, one of the problems that, that that we have which hasn't come up today is GDPR I mean Bill McLaren has got about 10,000 fan letters the copyright for all those fan letters belongs to the individuals that sent the letters one of the letters is is very very moving it is from an orphanage in Glasgow and it is dated 1987 and it is heartrending in what this little boy wrote to Bill. But I don't know whether under GDPR, I can actually make that available or whether I have to put, you know, access restrictions onto that document. 
and I multiply that by a factor of about 10,000. Yes, um, I was actually going to say we do have an expert actually um, with us who could maybe answer that question quite quickly. Um, I don't know if Sean, you're able to uh, jump yeah, in I guess, there. I guess the first thing to say is that we were hoping to have an event in December on these kinds of issues for community archives. And um, Audrey might be able to share the uh, details for that. Um, I can do that, yep. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I want to try and answer that exact question, but I, I think you raise an important point about copyright and probably a risk managed approach to copyright. GDPR can be more complicated. Uh, and yes, I think you're right. And we, I know Audrey has identified that a lot of community archives have seen a gap in advice on those particular issues. So that, that's something we are trying to, to address. Yeah. So it's a huge subject. So I can't, we're not going to sort of answer it now. But what yeah. I, uh... I just say, Audrey, oh, yes. the, the very fact that we are doing this today is a very important first step. And I, I think that your own network, the archives network, is, is first uh, and key to uh, a very simple uh, advertising or promotional campaign, whether it's done online or posters or whatever, to raise the profile of archives and what they can do. And to, I, th I think there's just a, a I touched on it briefly. You know, people don't understand, I think, generally uh, what the difference between a museum, uh, an archive and a library is. What can they do? Where do you go? Which one would you go if you have a carload of stuff? Or do you go to Murray Watson because that's easier? Well, you know, there's a whole circle that just needs to be, if I can put it stupidly, squared off here. <laughs> you know, we, can, we need to link everybody up and everybody needs to know for example, what does your sec what, what do the archivists do? And then you, when you turn it in your head, you end up in Richard Haynes's, um, the, the bogey he's got about, and we all share, about what can the archivists do when you actually arrive on their doorstep? You know, people need to understand, and maybe, you know, I don't know what Sean's event was going to do, but I think there's a lot of education or information that needs to flow in both directions. But I think principally from the archives themselves, this is what we do, this is how we can help, uh, and this is how we uh, can relieve you of the burden. Be be because these things are a burden to a lot of families. They just don't know where to go and what to do with them. I'm going to take you up on that because, you, Dan, you're right, it is for steps. Um, and what I would say at Scottish Council and Archives, and with this new network um, in Scotland of community archives and heritage groups, we are trying to give people in community groups best practice, advice and training. So referring back quickly to what Sean was talking about, um, Sean will be giving a short presentation um, in um, December. Um, we are collaborating with Historic Environment Scotland, um, also Archaeology Scotland. So collaboration partnership is key here. Um, if you want to find out about events and training that will help you manage your community archive, I really strongly suggest that you go onto the Scottish um, Council and Archives website where all the events are. And also if you uh, use Twitter, please um, uh, follow me, if you like, at um, C Archive Scott. Um, but you will find all that information actually on the Scottish Council and Archives website. It's a very good starting point. But we are trying to help. We are chipping away at, at this um, and we'll, we will provide lots and lots of links. Um, and definitely I can tell you uh, about the, the talk that Sean is going to be giving later this year. And then hopefully actually we're going to start a series of webinars on about um, adapting to digital and helping you with things like digitization and getting your collection online and how you list it or catalog it even. So there's lots of things in the future. This is just the beginning. Um, I've actually just noticed in the Q&A box that Alison has actually, so Alison Rosie is a professional archivist who works for the National Records of Scotland. So she's saying here, the National Register of Archives for Scotland is the body which gives advice on historical papers held in private hands and acts as a source of information and all issues relating to the care of archives. So it's happy to point owners to local sources too. 
Um, I would hand out Alison Rosie's email, but I'm not quite sure she'd be happy about that. So what I might do is when I respond to everyone who's attended and I am going to send out the survey link, which we really need to do on behalf of uh, the Being Human Festival, I can give you maybe some details um, of who you could contact um, about looking after your community archive. I hope that helps. Can I make one suggestion for yes. Matt? A very simple Q and A on your mm -hmm. website about GDR and all the rest of it would help answer some of these questions for Murray and people with a similar problem. You know, okay. do's and don'ts. That kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, we could do something simple and easy and something that people can interact with. That would be, we could do something. You need to do something simple and easy because after I'd read the guidelines on the National Archives website, I thought I needed a lawyer to help me. <laughs> Murray, I'm going to send you the link to Sean's talk. Honestly, that's what you need. That's your first. That's what you need to do first. Um, but we will cover it. It's a it's a, a big subject and it's really important to community groups who are maybe wanting to put things online and they're not thinking about data protection and GDPR. And of course, I don't want to sort of confuse things, but it could change a little bit when we are no longer part of Europe the whole Brexit thing. Uh, but it, that won't happen for a, a while. We're going to continue um, with the system that we've got in place. But changes are afoot. So. But we are um, in Europe. We won last night. <laughs> I know, for how long? Anyway, um, we're kind of going off and I'm going to see if there's any more questions and maybe we can, we can close. Um, I don't want to leave any questions unanswered. Um, so I'm just having a quick look through and I'm not seeing anything else at the moment. I don't know if the panelists are actually wanting to, to say anything else um, before we uh, finish for today. Uh, we've had a, a long session. It's been a, a really interesting. There's been lots and lots of information to take on board and think about. Yeah. I'm just going to give the Roger, panelists. Could I say yeah. something quickly? And it's in response to what Michael said and, and, and it was something that I you know, I touched on in mind, which is to do with the, the use of technology for dif different formats, I suppose, of, of getting materials to people with impairments. So, you know, one of, one of the, I mean, there's high tech and low tech, of course, and, um, you know, universities obviously uh, are able to draw on funds to do the high tech stuff, you know, 3D imaging and whatever. Um, but the low tech stuff in community, I and mean, we are really focusing today on, on in community, aren't we? So yeah. the use of, you know, a mobile phone to record things, you know, memories and that so on. And then I suppose the, the advice that people need then is, well, what, what, what next? You know, if I've recorded my, my, my granddad or my, my grandma about their, their golfing exploits, what can I do with it? Um, but the the key thing, I suppose, is you know you've created a uh, an important resource, and and things um, like you know uh, Echo Dots, Amazon Echo Dots, which are forty quid, um, you know, are interactive devices that people could use in, in this respect. You know, as I was saying, in terms of listening to stories. Um, but the, the key to that is is the, the the link between when we get the archive and obviously the end user using a particular technology is the metadata and the GDPR things all we've talked about. And, and I think that's, that is a, remains a major stumbling block for a lot of people, um, both in terms of personal collections, but also some of the really big collections related to sport and, and other things that the UK has. I mean, you know, um, the Bill McLaren commentaries are gold dust, you know, it's amazing. You know, I, I interviewed Bill as well. Um, and, and when, when he sadly was, he was, he was starting to suffer with dementia, but, um, you know, his stories and, but his voice, you know, is, is synonymous with rugby. And would it be brilliant at some point in the future that people could say, oh, can you Alexa play me the commentary of Bill McLaren's you know, barbarians uh, try from X whenever it was. And then it just suddenly, you know, comes on. And the, the technology exists to make that happen. But the infrastructure, the, t uh, the, um, the, the, the copyright issues and so on and so forth, the resource issues to make that happen don't exist. So, uh, you know, there's large organisations like the BBC and others uh, and, and governing bodies of sport for that matter 
that do have the power and to some extent some resource to to start to unlock some of this uh, again into this domain and in, into the ability of people to use um, very modern technologies like um, uh, smart speakers to draw down on on archives in interesting ways and useful ways um, which could be used for for this kind of reminiscence activity or other things or just just for pure pleasure um, and so the the technology exists for this to happen uh, and it gets over you know if it's radio commentaries or whatever that that gets over obviously um, uh, visual impairments uh, or film and, and so on obviously helps get over um, uh, hearing impairments so it, it, it is possible but we need you know the will and the commitment and the resource to make these things happen thank you Richard is there any of the panelists if you want to raise your hand um, uh, that want to just follow up on that at all I'm just having a look because I I mean I'm looking um, I'm sort of looking at Helen here actually a little bit um, and that's because I know that she attended one of our events and spoke to the person who is head of media at BBC and very kindly I mean it was a very good conversation and maybe Helen you are in a much better position to to talk about it and the resource that you managed to to get uh, for your groups. Yeah, well, this has been negotiated with Hugh Dan as well, actually, but um, that was Vicky Plain, uh, who is very high up in the BBC, and they've got an incredible archive of Shinty footage. Um, and so I sent her an email to say, you know, we'd be, it would be fantastic if there was some way of accessing that archive that they have. Um, and then Hugh, Hugh Dan's got involved now on a, for the national group, you know, rather than using it just for Baden up Shinty memories. Um, and there has been an agreement made, as far as I know, but the problem with putting anything that you put online, you are publishing. And so that's where the kind of copyright issues really come in. So um, we would be able to use footage for events and sessions that we're running in person, but not for anything where there's a kind of level of publishing going on. So at the moment, obviously, that's kind of a little bit impossible with the move to digital because it just doesn't allow that and it's completely understandable so I think when we're able to hold events again it's definitely going to be something that we will be able to make use of but you know copyright it, it can be quite prohibitive and the it as Sean had mentioned it's all about risk management and what you're prepared to to do within your organization and I think you, you know this collaboration between museums and archives and and they have so much knowledge about it. So it's been invaluable for us as in the Shinty project is to go back to them and find out about um, all of the copyright issues and, you know, for oral histories, making sure that you've got the correct permissions forms before you start. And then planning is a huge thing. Like, what are you going to do with them? What, what online platform are you going to put them on? And we're quite lucky because within High Life Highland, we've, we've got... Um, so we don't have a collections online yet as part of the Folk Museum. It's something that we're going to be working towards, but we don't have it there yet. Um, but we do have the Ambala website, which is already up and running. So it's really finding out about what's there and what you can make use of. Um, yeah, so we're, we're, we've kind of trialed a few small things working with Ambala and putting Shinty photographs up there, which then we can kind of share on Facebook page as well. Mm -hmm. But they can also take video and and audio so I think it's it's really just the power of working together I think is is crucial in all of this and just knowing what other people have so we do we hold objects at the museum the archives hold you know more the 2d material but and we do work in different ways as has been said but I think if everybody knows what's where and there's that kind of crossover it doesn't all necessarily physically have to be in the same place but if people know where to go and to signpost to get access to material I think that's a really key thing to do yeah it is I I, I do think uh, we will all be talking about this um, after this webinar is over I would definitely like to think about what we can do after Um, this initial uh, together and we'll build on it. 
uh, has, um, we've answered their questions. Um, and I, I think really we have, I, I mean, what I'm getting, uh, I just want to say this as a sort of great thank you, is you've obviously inspired a lot of people. Uh, there's lots of comments about what a great project, Lorraine. Um, and that goes for all of the, the, the speakers, actually. They've really enjoyed hearing what you have said today. Um, I will be writing to everyone. I will send out uh, links to other events that you might find interesting, and that will include Sean's um, talk. Um, which is part of more things, uh, but I think it will be interesting. Um, I just do want to say thank you to all our presenters today. They, um, it's been fantastic. I know it's a lot of work. Um, we have recorded this and we will um, have it available. We'll put it on the ACA website, but also we can um, send it out on the social media as well. So I'm going to clap. I hope you can all see me. I just want to say thank you very, very much and I hope to work with you in the future. So I'm going to close down the webinar um, and hope to see everyone again soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.